Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, glad uh, to see you here uh, on this session, even online. Uh, my name is uh, Span Sherbinin, and it is honor for me to be the chairperson of uh, this session. I guess uh, we can start uh, and uh, the first presentation, uh, the first the uh, speaker is uh, Kashtanova Stanislava from St. Petersburg uh, with uh, presentation stress uh, field uh, for oh. okay. uh, ah, from, present stress field for cylindrical shell with a circle hole under different uh, boundary conditions. Uh, please, Stanislava, uh, you have uh, 20 minutes for your presentation and uh, for maybe some short uh, questions. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Stanislava Kashtanova. I am from Russian Academy of Sciences and my colleague Alexey Rostinsky from uh, St. Petersburg Technological University. And today we present the stress field for a cylindrical shell with a circle hole under different boundary conditions and we will discuss a new analytical approach. So let's formulate the problem. We will uh, consider cylindrical shell with a circular hole of radius R0 with different boundary conditions. And um, the main thing that differs us from a plane problem is the curvature parameter beta, that is the ratio between the radius of the hole and the cylindrical radius and its thickness, uh, thickness of the shell. So when beta is equal to zero, it means uh, that um, it's plain problem. And uh, um, exactly parameter beta is the main protagonist of today's story. Uh, so uh, here we see a government equation that was uh, derived by uh, Laurier uh, from the system of equilibrium of uh, shell equilibrium equations. And uh, it depends on complex function phi that uh, contains uh, displacement W and stress function U. And the uh, uh, important moment that uh, the connection between stress field and uh, stresses and um, stress function is going through the second uh, derivative and that is, is important for boundary conditions. Um, so different boundary conditions uh, that we will consider. We will consider three types. First time is an actual tangent. It means that we applied um, load P at the ends of cylindrical shell uh, of an infinite cylinder, yes. And uh, the second type, it will be internal pressure, internal pressure Q0. And the third time is torsion. Uh, this problem has a rather history, uh, has a rather rich history. And um, uh, it was said by, firstly, it was said by Laurier in 1946, but because of some uh, imperfection and misprints in the boundary conditions, so there were, were the whole layout of scientists who, uh, who were trying to reconsider this problem, but mostly they did it by, by the way that uh, was offered by Laurier. Uh, some of them did it by numerical method. And um, what did they do? Um, this is the form of solution that was offered by classics. Uh, I will explain you uh, on the first case, uh, on the first type of boundary conditions when it's uh, uh, actual tangent, but the idea is uh, common for all of them. And um, um, it was get by standard method of separation of variables. So there are combinations of trigonometric and Hankel functions with a complex argument that contains a beta, yes, you see here is alpha and alpha x, it uh, uh, contains beta, r and uh, tet and uh, everything all together. And um, this, such, such form, uh, uh, in such form, this equation is, is uh, satisfied to the equation of mathematical physics and uh, boundary conditions at infinity. Uh, and um, so here, the last step you just uh, need to do to solve this problem is just to find this unknown coefficients a n and b n. And uh, uh, previously it was proposed to lay out into Taylor series by beta R, and then to find uh, this unknown coefficients also decomposed in beta from boundary conditions on the whole when you're equating expressions at the powers of beta. Here you can try it, uh, uh, here you can see how they tried to do it. And uh, of course, such method puts strong restrictions to the 
um, parameter beta from the point of view of mathematics. Yes, when you make a decomposition, decomposition, decomposition in small parameter, uh, this parameter can be small. And um, some of them try an analytical way, some of them try some numerical method like allocation method, for example, uh, the attempts you can see here. And all the time they got an unsolvable system and because uh, they had uh, a linear dependence in the equations and uh, by different tricks, they tried to overcome, to overcome it. And they wrote in their articles that it was a tedious way and, um, and we can confirm it because firstly, we repeat this classical way and even we got formals in explicit form for a uh, field of stress before there were no such uh, formulas in literature. Uh, and it's really tedious and hard way, but how we were surprised when, we, when it occurs so that either the solution is wrong or useless. What do I mean? I mean that, um, I mean that, так не слышно хорошо, все в порядке. Yes, I mean that uh, uh, if uh, the range of uh, beta is small, uh, yes, um, I mean that uh, it works when uh, the range of beta is small, for example, 1.0, 1.2, but it almost, uh, in the case uh, of uh, actual tangent, for example, it's a Kirsch problem, and this coincide and the results of this, uh, coincide with the Kirsch problem, so there is no sense to do all this hard to do work if uh, <clears throat> something... Uh, is uh, just a moment. Nope. Yes, if it doesn't uh, um, differ from Kirsch problem. But if we take better more than uh, 0 0.2, for example, 0 0.4, uh, it uh, doesn't um, satisfy boundary condition. And that means that the solution is wrong. So, uh, what conclusion do we have about classical approach? First, that expansion of basic functions into power uh, series and beta seems impractical due to the complex dependence in beta. And uh, here we have an uncontrolled uh, loss of occurrence and there is no finite system of equations for finding unknown coefficients. And if we try to substitute basic function, functions in the classical form into the boundary condition, it leads to extremely cumbersome calculations. And again, we have the same thing now that lack of joint system for finding coefficients and uh, you try to solve this uh, system by some approximate methods. And one more very important thing that um, limit transition while beta tends to zero can be hold. And um, um, this section breaks the boundary condition at infinity. So it was clear that we need to find some other form of finding uh, coefficients. And uh, after several attempts, we did it. Before substituting to the boundary condition, uh, we need to present each basis functions in the form of Fourier. And so here you can see, and here you can see uh, that we did the uh, separation of variables and uh, now beta r is sitting in uh, Hankel and Bessel functions without any theta and theta sitting in trigonometric function without any uh, beta r. Yeah, so, and uh, such view of basic uh, basis functions is convenient for substituting in, into boundary condition and allows to obtain solvable system for finding unknown coefficients. Uh, so I will not bother you by different calculation by, I mean, uh, by calculation technique, but uh, um, let's introduce uh, the notation for the Fourier coefficients and the trigonometric expansion of the basis function. Because here is, um, uh, because in terms of this G, uh, we will uh, solve our algebraic system. So for first and second type of boundary conditions, we have the same G. And for third time, uh, for third type, it's a little bit different because because uh, torsion has uh, uh, anti-symmetric nature. And here we have a small change in the sign and uh, uh, because of, of the signs, uh, uh, enumeration here from one, not from zero, but the common idea in any case is the, is, uh, the same. And um, here um, our solution uh, uh, fee for all three types is presented here. So for first type, when we have actual, uh, this uh, solution is sum from unperturbated solution. Here is actual tension or internal pressure or torsion and perturbated solution because of the hole. 
And uh, uh, this is the expansion in Fourier uh, series and Fn is going through uh, functions G, yes, that we see before on the previous slide. So yeah, and uh, with all this stuff, we're going to the boundary conditions. Again, I will explain the idea on the one type of boundary condition, but uh, um, it's transferred to all other type, uh, to all uh, other cases. So from each boundary condition, we uh, get a, a system of an infinite uh, equation. Yes, and then take coefficients uh, near cosinus, uh, near trigonometric functions. And in the result, we got um, infinite algebraic linear system. And um, uh, our uh, important and one of the main uh, part of our work that we could prove that one of the equation is a linear combination of, of foreign others. And because of it, we could exclude it. So we got an independent linear system uh, that we could solve. Because the fact of linear dependence of the equation, but the lack of understanding of which one puzzled many predecessors and it was a difficult place exactly here. And that, uh, uh, this proving and excluding extra uh, equation, we could uh, put our system in a beautiful matrix form. And more than that, for, for all three types, it uh, has uh, the same structure. Uh, this is the system and for first type uh, of boundary conditions uh, changing only in three members here or here. For third time, it's also the same structure, a little bit changing in T and G. Yes, they have a little bit another structure, but again, uh, another view, but uh, the structure of uh, the system, again, the same. And um, uh, this uh, system has an infinite number of equations and then don'ts and has block diagonal predominance. Therefore, a submatrix composed of the first four in rows and columns will have a non-zero determinant. And uh, when you solve a system of foreign equations, you get coefficients for the first two in basis function and uh, uniquely. I remind you that uh, each basic function have a n and b n, two coefficient. So we, if we have foreign equations, we found foreign coefficients, uh, uh, but foreign equations we need for two n basis function. And uh, um, if we take uh, larger n, the subsequent coefficients will be negligible. That, uh, again, it's about block uh, diagonal predominance because of it. Um, what about uh, satisfaction of boundary conditions? Any uh, finite partial sum of phi is an exact solution of the mathematical physics equations in the domain, in contrast, for example, for the solution of this, of, uh, this problem by risk method. And it satisfies the boundary condition conditions at infinity. In this case, our calculations show that uh, the boundary conditions are satisfied quite accurately for any beta, already uh, beta of a range from um, zero up to four. And it's uh, from the point of math, there are no restrictions. This restriction goes from the mechanical sense, uh, because if you take beta more than four, it means that it's very strong curvature or maybe it's very large hole. It's another theory of um, government equation from, from an, uh, there is, no, this equations. So this, uh, they, uh, this restriction, uh, not mathematical, it's mechanical restriction. And for this uh, range, it's enough, uh, uh, it's more than enough, 24 basis functions. We usually make calculations for 18 uh, basic functions and uh, we consider that for us, it's not. If you want more occurrence, you can, uh, you can take more. And all coefficients, wait, excuse me. All coefficients you can find from this reduced system. So um, just a quick slide to show that uh, boundary conditions is satisfied uh, uh, quite accurately. For example, for small beta, when you have 18 basis function, it's a uh, degree up uh, to minus 15. If beta uh, is equal to four, it's a uh, degree up to minus seven. But if you want uh, more occurrence, you can take more basic function, no problem. And here is uh, uh, the behavior of coefficients and again about the block diagonal predominance. Here you can see that, for example, if you take uh, uh, enough larger n, for example, 18 or 20, you can see that when beta um, is small, they're equal to zero. And they only start to play some role when beta begin uh, rather big from three, for example, yes. And so it's, uh, and in contrast uh, for small beta or for small not beta n, uh, when n is equal to zero or one, uh, it play a role when beta is small, but then it tends to zero and uh, uh, almost uh, 
no influence of the solution. It's again about blo um, we show here the um, block diagonal predominance of the matrix. And what about comparison of results? In general, uh, all results that were received in 70th years of 20th century uh, were for very small beta and they differed. And the numerical results are also uh, differs for one from another. And there were only one uh, work where uh, we found uh, uh, calculations for beta up to four. It was made by collocation method in, in the work of Van Dyke. And uh, for those periods, it was, how to say, strange results, and um, and it was single work with such results. And when we start our study of, for this problem, it was also rather, how to say, interesting, and uh, we didn't understand how, how he did it. But uh, when we made all of this our analytical approach and we got the same results, it was very nice, and we were very glad that we uh, we did it for, for all three case for actual tangent, for internal pressure, we have the same results. It's a beta from zero up to four years and for uh, torsion two. And, um, and here um, the results distribution of stress field, for example, when beta is uh, not small like uh, point, uh, 0 0.1, but not small for, for beta is equal to one. Here's type one, type two, type three, uh, boundary conditions different, yes. And for, uh, big better when better is equal to four um, how they behave and uh, the same pictures but uh, another comparison um, for example uh, for uh, for actual tension when better is small and when better is big how is changing yes these pictures how they changed or uh, the second time return pressure uh, this uh, white zones is because of uh, mathematic of uh, because it's has no enough colors for us. <laughs> so um, it's just, here uh, must be some colors, yes, of another gradient. And uh, a third type uh, for a torsion, yes, for small beta and for big beta. And um, uh, in this work, we make an accent uh, on mathematical uh, uh, derivation of the formulas, not maybe on uh, analysis of, uh, it's, it's the next work, it's the thing that we are working now about uh, the dis distribution of stresses and how they influence to stability of fracture or um, further analysis, uh, because our approach allows um, to analyze uh, this analogy, uh, um, formulas of stresses. And a couple of words about Peter Van Dyke, because now he's my hero, he's an engineer. He was an engineer in, uh, uh, he was not a scientist, he was an engineer in a Baltimore company who made um, um, planes. And um, if you're interested in it, I, I read an interview with him. And uh, uh, if you like it, I can send you too. And uh, so in con uh, our conclusion that we present a solution in a, another form, yes, not in a classical way, which exactly satisfies the boundary conditions and the qualitatively different analytical approach, which makes it possible to make a separation of variables and to remove their mathematical restrictions on the parameter beta. Uh, from a mechanical point of view, our model is applicable for the range for beta up to four. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, thank you Stanislav for your presentation. And uh, we have uh, some time for questions. Any questions? Hmm. I guess I can ask. Uh, uh, nice talk. Uh, so, so just a quick question: the the coefficient a n b n. Do you do you know how fast uh, they decay? Like you mentioned that this block uh, the, the diagonal dominant structure. Yes, of uh, course. So, oh, 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 rather you said fast. that they they become negligible after large n, and then so yeah. Just yeah, for our for our model, yes, up to uh, better uh, up to four. It's enough eighteen. Okay. 18, yes, okay. twenty is more than enough. Twenty four is. But like a um, n as a function of n, it goes like one over n. You haven't looked at the things like the arrow, how arrow decays as a function of n. <clears throat> because uh, the basically how the coefficient decay as a function of n like they uh, you know they get ah, less, yes, smaller yes. and smaller 
but there's an end like you you mentioned 18 enough 20 enough that's yeah but also like a n goes as one over n or one over n cube or one over n fifth power that type of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah we, we we have this uh thing in our article uh okay about this yes uh, I decided that it's that's so right. important now. Yeah. yeah. Of nice course, we made such a thank you. Uh, we uh, thank you, and uh, unfortunately, we don't uh, don't have uh, time for more questions. And I guess we uh, can go for uh, the ne next presentation. And the next speaker is Kuchuma uh, Ivana uh, from. Uh, Novosibirsk, uh, this uh, presentation were resistant of free based metallic glass uh, detonation coating. Uh, please. Uh, uh, oh. Oh. Hello, do you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Uh, uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues. I'm just sorry if I won't have internet connection because it's really so bad in a hotel where I'm staying here in uh, St. Petersburg. And uh, because of this, I think I would like to switch off the video that I won't solve internet for this. I hope uh, only my speaking would be uh, more than enough. Uh, my name is uh, Kuchumova Ivana. I'm from, I'm research, um, uh, I'm working in a Lavrentiev Institute of uh, Hydrodynamics at Novosibirsk and I'm studying uh, P and I'm PhD student of uh, Novosibirsk State Technical University. And I uh, would like to present uh, results of uh, investigation, the wear resistance of iron-based metallic glass or detonation coatings. Uh, from the 1960s, uh, when uh, the first time was discovered uh, amorphous materials, but by uh, Paul Duves, um, the uh, from this time, amorphous materials was uh, so interesting for from um, a scientific view. But after last few uh, decades, uh, amorphous materials also uh, interesting from engineering view. And uh, like shows uh, my uh, uh, literature review, which I made, the detonation spraying allows uh, to obtain uh, more denser coatings uh, for, of uh, iron-based uh, amorphous alloys uh, uh, compared with other methods of thermal spraying, uh, for example, like plasma spraying, uh, high oxygen fuel spraying, and so on. Uh, my coating was produced by computer control de detonation spray system, um, which was developed at Lavrentiev Institute of uh, Hydrodynamics. Uh, in general, detonation spraying is based on acceleration and uh, heating of the powder particles by the gas detonation products. And uh, by variation, uh, the type of gases, uh, their molar ratio and volume, uh, we can change uh, the thermal and chemical uh, influence on the powder uh, during detonation spraying process. The main goal uh, of uh, this work uh, was uh, investigation, the phase and structure formation during detonation spraying. Uh, on the seal substrate and uh, determination conditions of the formation high quality coatings with amorphous structure and studying of uh, its wear resistance. Uh, uh, the powder which was used uh, in, in this work, this multi-component uh, iron-based uh, alloy was produced by gas atomization. On this slide is presented him of uh, gas atomizer and uh, uh, on a couple uh, work and uh, his colleagues uh, was presented the results of uh, calculation of steel particles uh, during um, 
but the cooling uh, the rate uh, cooling rate of uh, steel particles uh, during gas atomization. And on this graph, it can be seen uh, that particles with a size uh, near uh, 18 micrometers uh, has a cooling rate uh, near uh, 10 in uh, five uh, power. At the beginning of uh, this work, we started uh, from investigation of morphology and microstructure of this powder. It can be seen uh, that uh, particles has a spherical shapes. Uh, also, uh, the microstructure, which is presented on a picture from the right side, shows that these powders uh, didn't have uh, a crane boundaries, which means that they don't have um, mm, crystal face uh, in their volume. Then we made uh, differential, uh, differential uh, scanning colorimetry investigation uh, for checking uh, temperature of transmission. Here it's presented um, like uh, thermal glass transmission, uh, thermal uh, uh, of uh, crystallization, uh, temperature of solidus and liquidus. And this is between uh, temperature of glass transmission uh, and uh, temperature of crystallization calls a uh, super uh, cooled liquid region. Uh, we what uh, and it's it's uh, fifty three uh, degrees Celsius degrees. Uh, what means that this alloy has a uh, high glass forming ability. Uh, then uh, we investigate the phase composition of this powder, uh, and it's show it's uh, it, it was shown uh, on this uh, graph. Um, and by uh, the Rietveld method was uh, calculated the crystalline phase content, uh, which is only five uh, weight percent. Then uh, we uh, calculated uh, the chemical composition of the detonation products. Uh, and here can be seen uh, the using molar ratio of uh, oxygen to acetylene gases um, uh, in one means uh, that um, detonation products environment, oh, I'm sorry, will be um, reducing. What mean detonation spraying the oxygen powder won't, uh, won't happen. Uh, uh, then we decided to change uh, explore uh, uh, to variate uh, to uh, the explosive charge uh, and uh, the calculation of temperature and velocity of particles, which was used uh, for this uh, work, um, shows that with using a few percent of explosive charge. Uh, the all particles with the size 20, 40, and uh, 30 micrometers uh, has temperature close to melting temperature of the alloys, uh, of the alloy, uh, which is uh, 1,440, uh, 442. Uh, in general, uh, the quality of um, coatings would be better if all particles will be in the liquid, um, uh, in the liquid uh, uh, God. in the liquid uh, system. Uh, and with increasing of explosive charge, uh, the velocity of these particles also increased. Uh, uh, slide up presents uh, its uh, results of um, uh, phase composition, investigation of phase composition of uh, the coatings which was produced with uh, a different explosive charge. And here it can be seen that all uh, these coatings has so low crystalli uh, crystalline phase content. Uh, in general, um, it's really uh, nice results in comparison with different 
uh, thermal spraying technologies where uh, uh, the highest, uh, uh, the lowest crystalline phase content, uh, which I uh, found was like 15 or 20 percent. Uh, he presented pro a micro hardness per action of uh, the coating. It can be seen that micro hardness, uh, this coatings, uh, which was produced with uh, so wide uh, detonation spray spraying modes, uh, has a really high uh, micro hardness. So low porosity, less than 1%, and high ad adhesion. In general, the micro hard of uh, this uh, coatings are close to uh, iron based uh, amorphous ribbons, uh, which is produced like uh, by the different methods. Investigation of structure of the coating by transmission electron microscopy shows uh, that the coating really have uh, amorphous structure due to this uh, diffraction halo, uh, which is visible on, uh, which can be seen on this slide. Uh, wear resistance uh, of uh, this coatings uh, was uh, investigated under uh, dry reciprocating friction conditions. And it could be seen uh, that uh, or detonation coating and uh, this results was um, compared with the stainless steel because our uh, previous investigation shows uh, that this kind of uh, this coatings from this multi-component um, uh, amorphous alloy has high uh, corrosion resistance. And uh, uh, here it can be seen that a coefficient of friction uh, has uh, uh, the detonation coating for detonation coatings um, uh, has uh, become uh, to steady state uh, regime so fast, what means uh, that uh, during uh, the friction test, uh, this coating ha has uh, shows a high corrosion, uh, high wear uh, resistance. Uh, after tests, was investigate the worn surface of this coatings. Uh, here can be seen uh, that during um, uh, friction test uh, uh, starts uh, delamination of the particles um, the, we, and then uh, this delamination particles because it stay uh, on a burn, on, in a worn surface uh, started to be like abrasive uh, particles which uh, can increase um, uh, the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the wear rate of uh, uh, this coatings. Also, uh, we found some uh, Wolfram on, uh, uh, on a worn surface, uh, which means uh, that some chemical um, connection will come uh, starts during the friction test because uh, um, uh, because this uh, tungsten uh, carbide ball, uh, I'm so sorry, not Wolfram, tungsten uh, carbide ball was used like a counterbody during this uh, friction test. Uh, here is presented the wear resistance, uh, which was calculated uh, by uh, this uh, equation, which shows uh, that um, uh, the wear resistance of um, detonation coatings, which was produced in a really wide uh, detonation modes, has in a two times, in a four times, like a minimum, uh, higher wear resistance in comparison with stainless steel. And here presented a uh, conclusion for this work and uh, this work, uh, this the reported study was uh, founded by 
uh, Air, FBR, and Novosibirsk region according uh, to research project with this number. And thank you for your attention. I would like to answer it for question if you would have it. Thank you, Ivana. Uh, do we have some question, colleagues? <clears throat> Can I ask? Uh, I am Sergey Luria. Hello. Yes, of course. Uh, uh, please answer, if you may, what is physical reasons of increasing crystalline crystalline phase for such materials? What are physical processes? Which uh, can you uh, say? Which uh, uh, physical reasons to increase of crystalline, crystalline phase and to receive materials uh, with amorphous structure? Um, uh, no, in general, this... Uh, uh, and which parameters this, may be uh, this optimal to this is, one? Mm -hmm. Thank you, oh, excuse I'm me. sorry, could you repeat please your question? Uh, I asked, what is, uh, what is your mind? What is physical reasons to increase of crystalline phase and to receive materials with uh, a very small crystalline phase and as it was to receive amorphous materials? Which parameters of technological processes uh, are main for, to, for, this, for this goal to receive amorphous? Properties. In general, for why we choose a detonation spring, uh, just because uh, for fabrication um, coatings with high amorphous uh, content, I have to be solved few problems. For example, powder have to be uh, heated up to the melting point, up to, up to the melting uh, temperature. And after this, it, have to, it has to be cooled down with so high speed. And uh, uh, you're especially uh, only detonation spraying because uh, the impulse process uh, it can solve this problem. But in general, uh, I think, um, uh, for example, cool, sp cold spraying, uh, it can't produce uh, amorphous material because uh, the temperature of the process in, in general is so low. And uh, I think um, from uh, the physical view, maybe uh, the main uh, uh, the main problem is uh, how to heat up uh, the powder for the melting point and uh, how to accelerate it uh, uh, so fast that it will uh, will uh, deform on a substrate and cool down uh, to the volume uh, uh, in the volume uh, of uh, the substrate. In general, after spraying, you can increase uh, the content of crystalline uh, uh, crystalline phase by uh, uh, post uh, heat treatment like annealing. And now uh, I have this kind of investigation. I'm making it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Uh, okay, thank you, Ivana. And uh, now we can move on for, for the next speaker, uh, Mohamed Montasser. Uh, this presentation it is residual stresses in a thermoviscoelastic additively manufactured cylinder subjected to, uh, to induction heating. Uh, please, Mohamed. Hello, everyone. Uh, do you listen to me? Yes, we uh, yes. hear you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Montasser Fikri. I'm from Egypt. I'm a PhD student in uh, Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology. Uh, we have uh, now uh, our work uh, under title Residual Stresses in Thermoviscoelastic Additively Manufactured Cylinder Subject to Induction Heating. 
Uh, this work uh, is done by uh, me and Sergei Alexandrovich Lichov. He is a professor in Institute for Problem in Mechanics in Russian Academy of Science. He also is uh, my PhD supervisor. Uh, we will talk in uh, six points here. We will uh, speak about the additive, additive, additive manufacturing technology, which is called Mohamed, also... Excuse me. Uh, we yes. can't uh, see your presentation. Maybe you should uh, share your screen. Ah, yes, I'm, I'm sorry. Ah, now do you see my screen? Yes, now we see your screen. Yes, all right. I'm sorry for this mistake. Yes, uh, our, tit our title uh, of the, our work is Residual Stresses in Thermoviscoelastic Additively Manufacturing Cylinder Subject to Induction Heating. Uh, this work is done by me and Sergei Alexandrovich Lichov. He is a professor in Institute for Problem in Mechanics, Russian Academy of Science, and he is also my PhD supervisor. We will speak here uh, uh, on four points. Uh, the first one, uh, we will speak about additive manufacturing technology, which uh, it's a new technology for uh, creating 3D uh, parts. Uh, and the problems that uh, appear in this technology, it's, uh, with, which is called residual stresses, here also we'll speak about skin effect uh, that we will use to heat uh, the the body that we will uh, uh, that will go, it will grow, and uh, the mathematical modeling for the growth processes, uh, the methodology that we have used, and the, the result the result that uh, we will show about the intensity of stresses. Uh, additive manufacturing technology, uh, or it's, it's called also 3D printing. It's uh, a process of making three-dimensional solids object from digital uh, three models. Uh, the main idea of this uh, technology is that the part is being created sequentially, layer by layer or part by part, due to melting and fusing, fusing me uh, metallic powder together in pieces, geometric shape. Uh, there are some problem challenges this uh, technology. One of them is that the metallic powder are heated to uh, melting temperature and then cold when they are already attached to the part, which causes distortion of its geometric uh, and causes uh, residual stresses. This is our problem here, how to decrease the residual stress. So what is the residual stresses here? Here's some definition about uh, for the residual stresses. Residual stresses are stresses that uh, remain in a solid material after the original causes of the stresses have been removed. Uh, to reduce the intensity of residual stresses, uh, the chamber in which the part is created is heated to a temperature slightly lower than the melting temperature and uh, maintained during the entire uh, synthesis process. After the processes, the part is slowly cold. Uh, in this in this part of technology, the residual stresses appear. So uh, there are many ideas, many uh, ways to uh, decrease the residual stress. One of them is to heat uh, uh, the whole part of uh, the growing body. But here in the present work, we proposed have proposed not not heat the whole part, but uh, uh, the surface uh, uh, of the cylinder the, in, in which we will be added. Uh, some layers. Uh, how can we uh, heat uh, the uh, surface of the cylinder? We have, uh, we know uh, uh, a very famous phenomenon, it's called uh, skin effect. The skin effect is uh, a tendency for alternating current uh, to flow mostly near uh, the outer surface of uh, an uh, electric conductor. Here we have a cylinder, so uh, if uh, in, in, inside the cylinder flow AC current, so uh, uh, the most of the current will be uh, flow near the surface. Here we have delta, delta it's called here skin dips, in which uh, flow about 37% uh, of, uh, of the value of the current. Uh, here we have uh, the expressions that gives us uh, uh, skin depth, it's depend uh, uh, on the frequency of the current. So if we have uh, uh, large, uh, big frequency, so we have delta here, it will be small. So uh, we can control the process if we uh, 
uh, decrease or if we increase the frequency of uh, the AC current, we can decrease this de this delta, this skin depth, and so we can uh, only heat uh, the uh, surface of the cylinder, not holds, not the whole cylinder, but the surface of the cylinder. Here, uh, by changing the frequency, we can change the the, the, the depth of the uh, heated layer. Here we have figure uh, uh, represents that uh, by uh, control the uh, uh, frequency, we can change uh, the intensity of alternative current. Here we have uh, uh, the uh, the whole definition for uh, for uh, the growth processor. We we sub we. Uh, Suppose that the growing body is represented as a finite family of bodies. Here, for P1 is the initial cylinder. After adding uh, a very thin uh, layer, uh, we will get uh, P1. It's a P, P0, it's a just a subset of P1. Uh, to add B, uh, one layer uh, into uh, P1, we, we need to uh, just time T, T1. So we have two sequences. This, 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 this two sequences. Uh, is determine the uh, the scenario of the growth. So this uh, uh, the whole definition for uh, the growth process. Now here, uh, in order to find uh, the residual stresses, we have to uh, solve some problem. Each problem we have uh, it, it will be solved in a, new, uh, in a different domain. For example, this uh, this problem it, it will be solved in uh, the, the initial domain P not. After uh, adding one layer, we have uh, another uh, problem. It's the same problem, but it's uh, in another domain. So we have here a sequence of problems. Uh, they are related to each other. For example, here uh, for, uh, uh, for the, uh, the second problem or the problem in domain P1, we have the initial condition. It's come from the previous step, from uh, uh, the step number zero and so on. So what is the problem that we have to solve here? We have a, a thermoviscoelastic cylinder, so we can solve uh, a thermoviscoelastic uh, problem that contains two equations. The uh, first equation is Lamy equation, which is called uh, equation of motion, and the second equation it's uh, it's just uh, the heat equation. But here we have uh, we uh, 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 have taken to account only uh, not fully coupled uh, not fully coupled problem. So here. In the heat equation, we have no uh, the parts that are related to displacement. In the future work, we will, we will present uh, the same problem, but uh, for for fully coupled, not not fully coupled. Uh, this uh, this equation suggests the initial and boundary condition for this problem. We have here uh, we suppose that the uh, the stresses uh, on the boundary it equals zero at each domain for each step. Uh, here, uh, this part it's uh, just the heat source. It's, 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 so uh, it's come from the jowl, the jowl heating uh, low. So we here, uh, like we said, we will heat uh, the growing body by alternating current. So we can we can use this uh, expression to uh, find the uh, amount of heating. Uh, uh, next slide, we have the same the, the same the same system, but in dimensionless form. So we used here the dimensionless uh, variable to uh, move uh, to uh, uh, move uh, the system in, into to uh, dimensionless uh, form. So uh, in order to solve the problem, we can solve separately the heat equation. After that, we can uh, find the distribution of the temperature and then substitute the distribution of the temperature into the uh, equation of motion in order to find the displacement. And from the relation between displacement and stresses, we can find the residual stresses. Here we have, uh, like I said, uh, the boundary and the boundary condition and the initial condition. We can see here, uh, uh, for, for example, uh, the displacement uh, at each step. For example, the displacement at uh, step number k, when t equals zero, it's just the displacement from the previous step. At the end, at the end moment of the previous step. Also for the temperature here. Uh, uh, the distribution of the temperature at previous at uh, the step number k when t equals zero, it's just the distribution of the temperature uh, of the previous step at the end moment of this step. Now we can move to uh, solve the uh, heat equation. The heat equation it's uh, just here. Uh, 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 
in homogeneous partial differential equation by uh, the Diomel principle, we can solve this equation uh, in order to get two, two, two solutions. The homogeneous solution, the homogeneous solution is only solve this part, the uh, homogeneous solution. Uh, and then homogeneous solution can be founded uh, from uh, the Diomel principle. So here we have, uh, we can solve this. So it's, it's, it's just a stormy evolved problem. So we have here uh, the orthonormal eigenfunction function given from this expression. So we can find the two solutions. The summation of these two solutions give us the, the whole distribution for each, for, for each step. Here, this, uh, this expression give us uh, the uh, Fourier coefficient for uh, for uh, the distribution of the temperature for of the of the uh, previous step. After uh, getting uh, the uh, distribution of the temperature, we can substitute here in order to find the uh, the solution for this equation. It's give us the displacement. Uh, to to do this, we suppose we have supposed that uh, the displacement it can be uh, given. Uh, by uh, decomposition uh, of two functions. The first function is it's depend on the radius of the cylinder and the second function is depend on time. In order to find this uh, uh, this function, we have supposed that uh, this part, this part of the equation, uh, it's equal uh, minus neta square uh, u. So now we have a new problem, a new storm level problem. We can solve this uh, problem. It's, uh, it's in one dimension, it's very easy to find this, uh, this solution. The solution of this problem, it's give us, uh, it will be in terms of PCL function. So uh, we have here uh, the, uh, the whole solution for, for uh, the problem. It's, uh, it's uh, also normal eigenfunction. Uh, after uh, find the uh, uh, the parts that relate to the radius, we can substitute the solution into the main equation here in order to find uh, uh, the whole solution for you. By doing this, we we will get uh, a new uh, a new uh, a new problem for uh, the part of that related to time for t. It will be uh, it will give us. Uh, Cache problem. Cache problem. Uh, it's also here uh, in homogeneous, uh, in homogeneous uh, uh, ordinary differential equation. The solution of this, it's also uh, it give us uh, two solution: the homogeneous solution and the non-homogeneous solution. By this way, uh, now we have uh, the whole solution: the solution for u and the solution for uh, t. It's give us uh, the solution for u capital. It's give us. Uh, it's it's only. Uh, depend on R and the solution for time is uh, for, uh, for, for time. So we, uh, the, now we have the solution for uh, the displacement. By the relation between uh, 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 displacement and stresses, we, we can use this expression to find uh, the, uh, uh, the stresses. Uh, about the result, here we have uh, uh, the result for uh, for two cases, the first case is uh, with heating, with heating uh, the whole uh, growing body. Uh, uh, this these two figures show this, and these two figures shows without heating, without heating the main body. The two uh, the two upper uh, uh, surface it's uh, give us the distribution inside the whole body, not only the boundary, but the uh, in the up and the down. Uh, uh, the boundary con the uh, distribution for heating only on the boundary condition. Uh, these two figures show, uh, show us that uh, the gradient of the temperature during, during the process is very small. So, uh, and this uh, leads to uh, decreases the uh, residual stress. And these two figures uh, uh, shows us that the uh, without heating the main body, the gradient of the temperature uh, during the process is uh, not so small. So uh, we, uh, without heating, uh, uh, appears uh, residual stress. Uh, so uh, now our result uh, for uh, the intensity of stresses show, show these two figures shows uh, the intensity of stress for two cases also. The first one is with heating the whole body, and the next, the second one, without heating. Uh, it's appear here uh, that uh, with heating uh, the whole body during the process, the residual stresses decreases decreases uh, significantly. 
for here 0 0.0008 and here 0 0.025. So by this result, we can uh, decrease the intensity of residual stresses by hitting the uh, the growing the growing body during the process. Uh, we have uh, in the next in the next work in the future work we will take into account not uh, the uh, the uh, not fully cobbled, but we will take uh, the uh, the uh, the full cobbled. That's so uh, in the next uh, in the future work we will hear uh, the bars related to uh, the displacement. And we will compare uh, the result with uh, uh, with uh, with uh, uh, currently result. Uh, that's all. Uh, that's uh, the result we have uh, we have got. And uh, thank you for your attention. If you have any question, please. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions? Okay, if we don't have a question, we can uh, go for uh, next presentation. Uh, the next speaker, uh, next speaker is uh, Alexey Kiselev uh, from Saint Petersburg. Okay, please, Alexey. Hello, you will give me screen. Do you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Just a second. Uh, I wish to get a pointer. Well, but it, it seems too difficult. Okay. But uh, you see my pointer so, so bad. One. Yes, we can see okay. you. Okay, okay, okay. So, uh, first of all, I would like to thank organizers who um, allowed us to give uh, this talk uh, at Mechanical Conference, though our subject is not exactly mechanics. Uh, but we hope that probably uh, some, pro some similar problems in, in mechanics can arise. And uh, it will give us uh, some inspiration. So I start with a very long introduction. Um, why, uh, why, sh why do we consider this problem? Uh, and then I will explain which is the problem. So uh, one of our motivation is uh, uh, other Popov's diffraction, uh, diffraction problem. Well, as, as far as uh, 1979, from Stiklov from Math Institute in St. Petersburg, um, was first to consider uh, the wave propagation al along a cubic parabola. Uh, so the problem was that there is some, uh, some surface wave right, uh, coming from here. Then something ha happens th here. Then a, lo a lot of energy uh, goes in this direction, and uh, something uh, scatters uh, in uh, well here. And he uh, he was first to write down uh, the uh, so-called parabolic equation, which describe, uh, describes uh, wave field here, and it attracted a, a lot uh, of mathematicians uh, of high class uh, and still attracts to consider the, the, this mathematical scattering problem, and it is not yet solved. Uh, uh, but uh, assume that we have not a cubic uh, parabola and a specific inflection point, but, but we have two arcs of circles. Should it be uh, more like the same? I don't know, but it is uh, our motivation if we can consider, if we solve such a problem, it will be uh, some um, competition to that, uh, that theory. We didn't solve this problem, however. So, we address a bit different problem. It was uh, a, prob a problem considered by Alexei Popov from Moscow. Uh, he is a radiophysicist. And his problem was the uh, following. Uh, you have here a straight, a straight uh, boundary 
everything is two-dimensional. And then it beca becomes circle or para parabola, and uh, here uh, curvature jumps. Uh, so he was interested only in, uh, in description of uh, <coughs> diffracted wave, which emer emerges from uh, the discontinuity point. Well, and we uh, re re revisit uh, his, uh, his uh, research, uh, having in mind uh, to solve uh, correctly uh, the, uh, the problem systematically. And uh, we are thinking, uh, we were much thinking about this, uh, this direction, uh, direction of uh, limit trade. A lot of, a lot of people uh, addressed uh, from various aspects of diffraction by uh, high frequency wave. Everything is high frequency. Uh, uh, tangent and non-tangent incidence, uh, a, a lot of people. Uh, but uh, everything, uh, every, uh, everything there was based on uh, heuristic assumptions. Uh, why, what is the problem? Why it could not be uh, solved uh, systematically by boundary by approach? Simply the following: that natural coordinates in uh, such problems are uh, n s uh, arc length and uh, normal length. Uh, and if we pass from Cartesian coordinates to these coordinates, uh, this mapping is not smooth. And uh, equations uh, which we get uh, have a very strong singularities. And uh, uh, we were first uh, people to overcome these singularities and uh, consider uh, uh, diffraction by a jump of curvature with a non-tangent incidence. Uh, and uh, uh, we applied the systematic boundary layer theory, uh, we solved, we, we, were, we managed to solve uh, this uh, equation, which, uh, which are non-trivial, rather non-trivial. Well, so, uh, so in, in, this, in this case, uh, the boundary layer is uh, uh, the same scaling uh, in uh, normal direction and in tangent direction. Uh, uh, the, the scaling is the same. The same. So, so we described uh, the diffracted wave field and the wave field in uh, the direction of uh, limit ray. And, no, and now we come to the problem which we, which we cons uh, consider uh, Alexei Popov's uh, problem. So we have an uh, incident plane wave. Uh, we have a uh, uh, Newman condition on the surface. Here we have a jump of curvature, and this uh, this can be a circle or parabola. Uh, it's uh, the same, and so we are uh, looking uh, looking for uh, outgoing field, which uh, which is generated by uh, this uh, incidence. Uh, okay. Now. Uh, so, uh, now, uh, near the uh, near the point, uh, singular point, uh, curvature had the for, uh, such a form, uh, where a uh, uh, heaviside function is involved. And in this case, uh, the boundary layer is uh, have different scales in this direction and in this direction. Well, in uh, this consideration, or uh, famous uh, paper, papers by uh, Fock, who considered, uh, who considered a wave field on a smooth body. Uh, well, he considered, well, what, what he considered is uh, described, uh, picturized here. He described wave field in vicinity of uh, tangent, uh, tangent ray coming to a smooth body. High frequency, everything uh, is high frequency, and uh, he understood that uh, uh, that uh, such, such is a true uh, dimensionless par parameter. K is wavelength, uh, kappa is curvature, and uh, scaling uh, with respect to in S and uh, nu is different. And he derived a certain uh, well. 
So, uh, so we, we f f f follow more or less his ideas, and the idea is as, uh, as follows. Uh, we uh, write down the incident wave. Uh, uh, well, we separate out, uh, we separate out incident wave and uh, make uh, scaling in the equation for this uh, function which is called the attenuation factor and get and get uh, what uh, Fock called parabolic equation though it is a Schrodinger equation and uh, in our case we, ha we have a singularity in the equation a heavy side function and singularity in a boundary condition well uh, uh, natural idea is to see it as a Fourier integral, and we come to equation which is very different from uh, Fock uh, had. How to solve this equation? Well, we were lucky to find it uh, explicit equation, uh, explicit solution. I is a uh, I is a so-called uh, non-homogeneous area function. In Fox papers, uh, it, it was a standard area function. So, so we find the solution. Uh, we uh, uh, investigated it more or less in the same manner, in a similar manner to Fox theory. Fox had uh, area functions. We have uh, uh, this uh, non-homogeneous function. Well, uh, it is uh, not a subject to be spoken at such a short time. And what we get, uh, what we get, we have, uh, we got uh, here, uh, here we have an incident wave and the uh, scattered uh, diffracted wave from the uh, um, singular point. And it has, it has such, a be, such a behavior. Uh, when the angle becomes small, it becomes inf infinite. Uh, so uh, here arises a boundary layer, and there are several boundary layers similarly to form, but not, but um, far, far from being the same. Here, we, here the uh, incident wave and the diffracted wave combine. There is uh, what folk called fre fre Fresnel background and. Uh, Fresnel uh, field and background and the uh, shadow zone. So we have uh, we have more or less investigated uh, this solution. So thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you. And uh, now we have some time for question. Dear colleagues, do we have some question? Probably someone knows some problem uh, in elasticity, which could be more or less similar to this. And, uh, probably we can think about it. Сергей Гаврилов хочет просить вопрос задать, кстати говоря. Обратите внимание. Okay. Yes, uh, Sergey, please. Sergey Gavrilov, can you hear us? Okay. If you have time, you can write to me a message in. Um in this system. Раз, раз, раз. Меня не слышно? Слышно, слышно, теперь слышно. А, отлично. Алексей Прохорович, what was the main hack? Main who? Ну, Что, вот какой прием был, по сути дела, главным? Почему удалось сделать то, что не удавалось? Божественное проведение. Вот ничего не... Чудо, чудо. 
чудо, ну, мы чудом, вопрос. чудом решили это уравнение. Вот что нового вы придумали? Нет, мы, мы решили некое we solved certain equation with well, boundary layer by Fourier transform reduces to uh, reduces to one dimensional equation integral differential differential with a very special boundary conditions and we found its explicit solution well it is a it is a miracle for, for still for us it is a still a miracle okay <laughs> thank you Yes, and we hope that probably miracle will repeat, uh, miracles will repeat and repeat as we uh, come to other problems of uh, this series. But probably not. We, we cannot prove uniqueness, for example, of this equation. I have no idea how to prove it. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you. And maybe we have uh, uh, another question from someone. No? Okay, I guess we can uh, go uh, for uh, to the next presentation. And uh, the next speaker is uh, uh, Sidova Olga uh, from St. Petersburg. Olga, uh, please. Uh, you have uh, 20 minutes. Olga, are you here? Uh, yes, sir. I'm here. Can you hear me? Oh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I'm trying to share my screen with the presentation. I hope this works and you can see my presentation. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Please let me know if something is going out right. Uh, so now I'm going to start. My name is Olga. I'm from St. Petersburg, Russia, uh, St. Petersburg State University. Uh, and I'm going to uh, present a part of a research devoted to mechanical corrosion of uh, high-pressure vessels. It is a joint work with Professor Julia Promina. Understanding um, corrosion behavior characteristics is of great importance in science and engineering. According to some data, about 10% of yearly produced metal are spent uh, on compensating for corrosion loss. Uh, the annual corrosion costs uh, ranged uh, from 3 to 6 percent of a gross domestic product um, in industrial countries. Mm. Corrosion may be classified in different ways, and one of them is uh, the distinction by the type of damage, either local or general corrosion. Uh, general corrosion uh, can be observed in many structures, for example, when a protective uh, film is absent. Pressure vessels are often uh, suffering from a uniform corrosion, and uh, when uh, they are exploiting, the temperature of the environments may be different and uh, the temperature may affect the corrosion rate. Um, let us consider a linearly elastic thick um, spherical vessel under internal and external pressure exposed to double-sided uh, corrosion and the temperature of environments um, are TR and T uh, capital R. 
uh, when a uh, structure uh, is exploited or uh, being subjected to both mechanical loads and operating environments, uh, as, as the case we consider, uh, this often causes the process of so-called mechanochemical corrosion. Uh, this is um, the more intensive uh, than the simple uh, superposition of damages induced by mechanical stresses and electrochemical corrosion taken separately. According to experimental data, uh, there exists a threshold stress uh, value uh, with the property that when the stress is uh, less uh, than the given threshold, uh, the stress uh, doesn't practically influence the corrosion rate, like in formulas 1 and 3. Uh, but uh, when the stress value is uh, greater than the threshold in absolute value, uh, so then uh, the stress uh, affects the corrosion rate, uh, as in formulas 2 and 4. Uh, and uh, also we are going to uh, consider the possible inhibition of corrosion, which may occur when the closed oxide uh, film forms on the surface, and this inhibits corrosion process. Uh, this uh, uh, second multiplier in uh, all four formulas is uh, uh, to, to consider this um, inhibition process. And the third multiplier uh, is uh, for taking into account the temperature effects. Uh, those um, uh, temperature, um, those multipliers, uh, we should uh, take them into account only when the temperature at the surface uh, is greater than uh, the temperature uh, threshold value um, on this surface. Uh, all the parameters here are experimentally determined constants and uh, the stress which is um, affecting corrosion process, uh, uh, we uh, call it uh, equivalent stress. And what is it, equivalent stress? Uh, different authors uh, use uh, different stresses uh, as the equivalent one, uh, but uh, it was uh, shown uh, in experimental data that uh, the best correspondence uh, with experiments we have when we use uh, the maximum principal stress as the equivalent one. So we are going to use this uh, maximum principal stresses on the inside and outside uh, the surfaces of our thick uh, spherical vessel. Uh, so, uh, this uh, maximum principal stresses, uh, we um, consider thermoelastic stresses. The first uh, uh, term is uh, mechanical stresses, which are, are calculated uh, by the Lamea formulas. And uh, the second um, term is uh, thermal stresses in a thick shell uh, under different uh, temperature of uh, environments. So, um, in the period of mechanochemical corrosion, uh, the stresses uh, change due to the size reduction of the shell, and the changing stresses in their turn uh, enhance the corrosion process. Therefore, we have a closed loop. Corrosion wear leads uh, to size reduction, which leads to stress increase, uh, which accelerates corrosion wear, and so on and so on. Uh, thus, for the strength analysis, we have to solve an initial boundary value problem with unknown boundaries. Uh, we managed to solve uh, that uh, problem of analytically for different cases, as you can see on the screen, uh, and the solution can be found in the paper published uh, this year. Uh, we are not uh, going to derive the solutions now, I just uh, will highlight a few interesting moments. Uh, our purpose for today is to analyze the effects of uh, the pressures and temperatures and other parameters on the lifetime of the shell. Uh, a little about the solution. Uh, when uh, we have uh, different temperatures and different pressures on uh, inside and outside surfaces, 
the solution the problem is divided into three parts we call them stages the first stage uh, correspond uh, to the period when the stress values on both surfaces uh, are less than uh, given thresholds uh, in uh, it is a stage of uh, double-sided corrosive wear and um, Mm, uh, the second stage, intermediate one, uh, begins when uh, the stress on one of the surfaces reaches the corresponding threshold. So, corrosion on only one of the shell surfaces is accelerated by stress. Uh, and for this period, uh, uh, there are two possible situations. Uh, the first of them is the case of the inside mechanochemical corrosion and outside uh, corrosion where which is not accelerated by stress. And uh, another situation uh, of uh, um, outside uh, mechanochemical corrosion and inside uh, corrosion wear. Uh, and finally, when the st uh, both uh, stresses um, reach uh, corresponding threshold, uh, we have third stage when both corrosion rates are accelerated by stress. And this is uh, the most uh, interesting and uh, difficult situation and uh, I can show the, the solution for this situation uh, which we obtained. Um, for all those uh, stages we reduced the problem to an ordinary differential equation and obtained the solution. Um, let's uh, proceed with some calculation results. Uh, the effect of different combination of the signs of the thermal and elastic stress uh, components at the fixed pressure, uh, um, fixed uh, uh, pressure difference, and uh, and uh, fixed uh, temperature difference um, is shown this in the figure. Uh, we can see that um, uh, the Mm, depending on the combination of the signs of uh, pressure difference and temperature difference and uh, depending on the absolute values of uh, those differences the circumferential stress uh, may be positive or negative uh, in uh, and uh, its uh, absolute value reach uh, maximum uh, on in on the inner as well as on the outer surfaces uh, together and um, uh, the absolute value on, uh, of the total circumference and stress always reach the maximum uh, at the inner surfaces. Uh, else, uh, it can reach the maximum either at the inner or, or the, uh, at the outer surfaces. And uh, when we have fixed uh, pressure difference and temperature difference, uh, the life of the shell is always less uh, than in the opposite case. Uh, irrespective of, of where the uh, maximum stress is reached. Uh, um, we can see in this uh, figure that um, mm -hmm, the blue uh, curves uh, without asterisk uh, grow a little more slowly than the other red curves with asterisk. It is because uh, uh, blue curves actually don't uh, consider temperature effect because uh, the beta for uh, blue curves are zero and beta for red curves is uh, not zero. Uh, the next figure demonstrates the mechanical inhibiting effect uh, compared to simple corrosive wear. Um, the parameters we used are shown in the slide, and uh, we can see uh, two curves for each of the three stages I mentioned earlier. Uh, we have uh, red uh, curves for double side corrosion, um, for double side mechanochemical corrosion when both uh, corrosion rates depend on stress, and um, uh, second curves when one of the corrosion rate depends on stress and uh, third curves uh, when both corrosion rates uh, do not depend on stress and uh, solid curves um, are built for B uh, equal to zero and um, 
diamonds are built for B, not zero. And we can see that uh, inhibiting effect um, can uh, um, affect uh, the life of the shell um, um, very much. <laughs> That's it. Um, the next uh, figure uh, is uh, dependencies uh, of stress on time for different uh, beta and different uh, pressure difference and different temperature difference. Um, we can see that um, the initial value of total circumference of stress does not completely determine the life of the sphere uh, at fixed corrosion kinetic parameters. So, uh, we can see that there may be situation with, uh, when the stress uh, with the lower initial value uh, increases faster uh, than uh, the uh, stress uh, which uh, was at the initial time greater. Uh, we can see that uh, for green curves, uh, the initial stress is uh, greater than for blue curves, but uh, the um, lifetime of the blue curves is uh, less than the lifetime of the shell, uh, which is um, marked uh, with green lines. And also we can see this uh, temperature effect once again, uh, because uh, we have this uh, curves with asterisk uh, for no zero beta and uh, curves without asterisk uh, for zero beta and we can see that for zero beta the lifetime is greater than for no zero beta so the temperature affects the lifetime of the shell. Uh, this uh, figure uh, shows the dependencies of the relative stresses on time uh, we can see here the total stresses, red curves, the elastic component of stresses, uh, green curves, and uh, the thermal component of stresses, uh, blue curves. Uh, we can see that uh, the, um, the thermal stresses are almost constant through all the time. Uh, um, but uh, still uh, they uh, have uh, the effect because uh, mm, uh, because they uh, they can be with uh, different signs and uh, we, uh, we saw that the temperature affects the uh, lifetime of the structure. <laughs> Uh, here uh, we can see the dependencies of the stress on time and thickness on time uh, for different uh, better situation and uh, for different better values and uh, for uh, different uh, different uh, outside temperature when uh, the inside temperature is fixed. Uh, it is uh, shown that uh, for zero beta, once again, we have uh, a greater lifetime of the shell than for uh, no zero beta. Um, okay, uh, and uh, here I can show you the uh, table of the lifetimes uh, of the spheres for different uh, beta values once again and for different uh, temperature values, different uh, inside temperature and different outside temperature. And we can see that uh, uh, both uh, beta coefficient and both uh, temperatures uh, mm, affects uh, the lifetime of the shell. Um, that was everything I was going to say. Uh, and to sum up, uh, the uh, corrosion inhibition may noticeably increase the difference uh, in the lifetime and the stress-assisted corrosion and corrosion uh, with the rate uh, not depending on stress. 
uh, we found solutions uh, that allow to find the initial thickness at which uh, corrosion will have time to stop before reaching the maximum allowable stresses. Uh, the initial value of the total thermoelastic stresses does not completely determine the life of the shell. Uh, the total stress with the lower initial value may increase even faster than uh, the stress uh, uh, then uh, uh, the, the stress in the shell of when uh, the initial uh, value of stress was uh, greater. Uh, at fixed pressures, uh, the life of the shell does not always monotonically decrease, there is an increase of, in the temperature difference, so it is a uh, very interesting effect too. Um, um, that is all. Thank you very much for your attention. I can ask your questions. Okay, thank you. And now we have uh, some time for uh, short questions. Do anybody have some questions? Uh, okay, I have uh, one uh, question. Uh, what uh, about uh, experimental validation of your results? Uh, do you have uh, some ideas uh, how it can be performed? Oh, it is uh, very different to perform uh, the experiments with um, shells and um, pressures and temperature and um, corrosion inhibition, everything like this. But, uh, uh, our parameters and our uh, mathematical model are based on experimental results. So uh, uh, some authors uh, um, did some experiments and uh, found the, um, the relations, the uh, mathematical model for the process. And we used the mathematical model they found to uh, build our solution. So our solution is actually already based on experimental results. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, okay, and uh, now we can go for the for next presentation. The next speaker is uh, uh, Shamin Anastasia uh, from Moscow. Okay, Anastasia, you have uh, 20 minutes for your presentation and maybe some questions. Uh, Anastasia, we don't... Видно экран, да? Yeah. Слышно меня? Uh, yeah. Yes, now we can see your screen and hear okay. you. Okay. Hello, my name is Anastasia Shamina and the topic... Um, and the theme of my presentation is numerical modeling of fracture with uh, band and space. In elastic medium, uh, weakened uh, by a system of cracks in, is considered. Considering a crack, uh, we mean that it is the area where the interception of uh, displacement of fields take place. Uh, two different problems are studied. Uh, one of them, uh, when uh, the load is applied far from uh, the crack, and, uh, but uh, the crack faces are free of stresses, and we uh, call as crack passive. If the load is applied uh, on the crack faces, uh, when then such a uh, a crack named active. There is a stress a singularity near a crack tip. The aim of the work is to determine the values of stress intensity factors. The definitions are shown on this slide. Each of them corresponds to its own type of the loads. The first of them uh, corresponds to the normal tension. The second one uh, corresponds to the share, and uh, the third uh, uh, to anti-plane strain. Here, the KFAB, uh, it is a contour uh, of crack. The vector n is a normal to the contour, tau is a tangent vector, 
and uh, that is a transversal axis pen perpendicular to the plane of the crack and uh, S, it is the distance from some point to the crack quantum. The crack growth criterion uh, determines by the critical value uh, of the strength and density factor. Because uh, the crack uh, quantum is a curvilinear, and it is better to use another characteristic name, the energy release rate G. Uh, we will use the basic equations of, of the theory of plasticity, the Lamas equations, Hooke's law, and the expression for uh, deformations. And as we know, all components of the displacement vector satisfy uh, the biharmonic equation. One of the general representation of solutions of the theory of plasticity, it is a tracked uh, representation where the functions phi and C uh, are harmonic and satisfy uh, this equation. Um, in our problem, uh, the interception of uh, displacement field take place. And so we choose P as a function of the double layer potential. With the help of uh, potential, mm. potentials of single and uh, double layers, uh, we get three independent solution. In the first uh, one, the first components of displacement vector is broken. In the second uh, one, the second, and the third, the third component. Uh, we choose the solutions based on the boundary conditions. And uh, now, knowing the displacements, we can find deformations, and knowing the deformations, and using Fuchs law, uh, we can find stresses. Uh, for a rectangle uh, form for boundary element, and when uh, potential density is equal to one, uh, this integral uh, we can uh, calculate analytically, and in this slide you can see um, the, the result. Um, the method of boundary elements or its modification, the method of discount displacements, both used uh, the numerical method. The global X or Y uh, coordinate system is selected and the correct area is shown in gray and divided into boundary elements. A local uh, coordinate system is selected in the center of each element and uh, since each boundary element introduces its own stresses and displacements, you eat uh, a called influence uh, coefficients and uh, the eta is a constant unknown uh, coefficient. Uh, we will pass from the uh, global system coordinate to local one and used uh, transition matrix. Uh, summarizing up uh, with and defend uh, coefficients, all the influence of what all elements bring to the center of the element with number n, we obtain a system of equations. Uh, the system matrix is written in block form, and after solving the system, the solution of the problem is uh, represented as a series uh, of unknown functions. Thus, we can know the stresses and placements in each point, and we can calculate the value of stress intensity of factors. Uh, for the calculation, we use two methods by asymptotics of uh, displacements. We knew uh, displacements, it is this point, and um, have square approximation, and uh, then we uh, can, uh, and we have uh, the equations for um, stress intensity factors. In a similar way, the stress uh, intensity factors are calculated from the asymptotics for stresses. Uh, the method was used to write the program code in uh, C++ language. The problem of a uh, plan uh, crack under pressure was chosen as uh, one of the tests for verification. In solution, uh, its solution is given in Ufland works. The expression of the stress loan um, uh, 
uh, the correct continuation as follows. Uh, calculations was carried for two values of the radar and um, on a coarse grid. Uh, in this case, uh, the error about um, 20 percent. Uh, we also wanted to understand how uh, the numerical and analytical solution uh, can set and uh, as a solid one in the graph show the analytical solution and the circles and uh, crosses show the numerical solution uh, on the long graph continuation in two directions. Uh, to minimize the error, uh, we used uh, the small grid, and in the left um, graph, uh, you can see a solid curve. Uh, it's a numerical, so I'm sorry, it's analytical solution, and dotted curve, it is a numerical solution. On the right side, you can see uh, the graph for relative error, and here uh, the error about um, Two and half percent. The uh, compression of stress intensity factors you can see in this slide. It is uh, analytical formula for this problem. Uh, solid curve. It is analytical solution, um, and uh, dot it is a numerical solution. Q, uh, S is a distance from correct tip. In the right. Uh, Relative error here uh, it's about uh, three and a half percent. After ver verification, um, calculations uh, were uh, carried out for a fracture with a band. Mm, active and passive cracks were studied. In this slide, uh, it's an uh, active crack uh, boundary conditions. Uh, was uh, loaded with international pressure. Theme. Um, the parameter was uh, investigated for two different band angles, and uh, it can be seen that the maximum of value of the parameter G is reached on the band line, uh, which means that uh, with uh, such parameters of prep, uh, it will grow along the band line. And uh, in this slide, uh, we can see a passive crack. Uh, crack boundaries are stresses free. And uh, in here, uh, the parameter G uh, has maximum in bank line. Uh, so uh, this um, fracture can grow uh, to bank line. Main conclusions. In the calculation performed, the maximum value of the stress intensity factor is realized at the point of the boundary and the vicinity of the band line. That is a possible growth with occur along the band line, uh, regardless of the type of load. If uh, a fracture with the band in under pressure, then its opening depends weakly uh, on the fracture angle. And the stress field uh, essentially depends uh, of nature of the applied external load and the correct number uh, load applied at infinity is uh, less stable. It follows from the uh, compression of value of the combination of stress intensity factors for a crack under pressure and uh, for a crack in space subjected to tension at infinity. Mm, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you. Anastasia, and now we have uh, time for some questions. If we have one, have, uh, colleagues, do you have some questions? Uh, okay, then I uh, can ask one. Uh, uh, what uh, are the advantages of uh, methods methods that you used? Uh, this method uh, of the boundary elements. Uh, uh, what advantages uh, in comparison with standard finite uh, element method or finite volume method, method uh, or so on? Okay, uh, we uh, use boundary element method because um, 
It means Не могу. Потому что нужно только на границе сетку э, разбивать. То есть меньше нужно оперативной памяти для того, чтобы пользоваться этим методом. Окей, я понял. Спасибо. И теперь мы Седова Юлия. Uh, from Saint Petersburg, uh, Yulia, please. Yes, good afternoon. Mm -hmm. uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and we uh, see your presentation. All right. Uh, my name is Sidova Yulia and I will present you uh, the, uh, our research. In the case of uh, accounting for skin effects in hydrogen charged samples in a CD model of cracking. Engineer practice is constantly faced with the problems of hydrogen embrittlement, uh, hydrogen brittleness, and hydrogen destruction. This is explained by the fact that hydrogen is widely spread in nature, either in the gaseous state or in the form of chemical compounds. Uh, and while the limited content of other alloy components varies within hundreds of a percent, a significant effect of hydrogen on the material properties of some metals is occurred at a much lower mass concentration, 100,000 uh, of a percent. And uh, even if this low concentration can be ensured during the production of alloys, uh, the subsequent uh, processing and operation of metal parts lead to the same increase in hydrogen concentration, and uh, it begins to significantly affect the properties of material. Uh, one of mechanical properties, uh, which is especially strongly influenced by hydrogen, is track resistance. Therefore, to date, the generally accepted and most developed approach to deciding this uh, mechanism E of hydrogen induced destruction are based on crack propagation theory. One of them is hydrogen enhanced localized plasticity, help. That postulates that hydrogen is concentrated at the crack under the action of the tunnel stresses. And when it produces the energy required for nucleation of these locations, which are formed and accumulate near the stress computer. Plus, according to the health, regions of localized plasticity are formed or in the our roads, the material softens at the crack peak. And our approach is hydrogen enhanced decohesion model, FIDE. It, on the contrary, considers fundamentally brittle fracture without plastic deformation. Its main idea is that with an increase in the local concentration of hydrogen, the energy of formation of three fracture surfaces decrease, the adhesion of the crack edges decreases, and the delamination occurs. The development of these models was accompanied by many test experiments, most of which were carried out on samples after their artificial charging with hydrogen, usually in an electrolyte solution using a cathodic current. With the development of this research, it was found that the fish of the face of different samples have a non-uniform fracture pattern. Little fracture occurred, uh, occurred according to the mechanisms of hydrogen abitement gives way to the ordinary destruction, which, is, which uh, does not have pronounced hydrogen signs. This fact induced researchers to use the combined hell plus their approach. But the authors note the existing problems with the determination of many model parameters and uh, point out that the simulation results are only in uh, qualitative uh, agreement with the experimental one. Moreover, in all these works, the researchers assumed a uniform distribution of hydrogen concentration inside the metal resulting after the charging with it. All changes in the hydrogen concentration were associated with its uh, redistribution under an external law or during the care growth. Furthermore, in all existing works, as a rule, the value of the initial hydrogen concentration is established based on the results of fitting the model parameters for comparison with the experimental data. And its value in different works varies from uh, 5 10,000 ppm to 2 ppm. At the same time, charging with hydrogen leads to a strongly inhomogeneity of uh, distribution of hydrogen concentration. As a result of that, the concentration of hydrogen in a surface layer with a thickness of uh, the order of one size of the metal grain is 10 times concentration inside the sample. 
The phenomena is called the skin effect, and so far it hasn't been considered in modeling collagen diplomas and collagen in this structure. Uh, from the comparison of the HELP and HIDA approaches, it follows that the HIDA mechanism corresponds to the concept of visual fracture of certain skills at high collagen concentration. Therefore, the use of this mechanism in describing the influence of the skin effect on the cat rock should provide an acceptable model for the destruction of hydrogen uh, charge samples. Within the header model, the process of hydrogen transport inside the solid is usually considered as a diffusion process. To describe it, uh, heat flow is applied modified by the additional term that takes into account the thermodynamic or chemical potential. Considering the effect of mechanical stresses, it can be written as additional one. At the next stage, the fracture criterion associated with the crack opening displacement is considered. According to Gorsky's law, when the sample is loaded with the center load, hydrogen is concentrated in the region of the maximum average normal stress, due with, uh, to which the adhesion of the crack agents decreases. It leads to decohesion. In the framework of the HD approach to describe this change in the cohesion forces of grains, the parameter theta of the degree of filling the fifth surface of crack with hydrogen atoms is used. This formula was obtained by Cerebrinsky by comparing the value of these uh, filling parameter of hydrogen traps in the metal based on the McLean's ratio. It should be noted that in the case of using the value of a partial concentration of a substance in this ratio and keeping in mind the value of concentration presented in TPM, expression takes the form 2. Based on the value of the parameter theta, the changes in the specific energy of the crystal phase gamma is determined by expression 3. After that, the energy ratio is considered, and it's assumed that the maximum value of the relative displacement of track edges at which there is no breaking of bond between them deeply depends on the value of the parameter theta. Following these considerations, the law of hydrogen degradation can be represented in position form. In present study, we investigate the applicability of the model to a description of hydrogen induced destruction of a cylindrical sample considering the skin effect. To monitor and control dependencies and parameters used in the model, we have abandoned the analysis with standard finite element packages and to implement the approach, we developed a program code written in the Microsoft Visual Studio in C. It allows to obtain a numerical solution for the problem of the stress and state of a hydrogen integrated solid by the finite volume method. The calculation of the static problem was carried out based on the equation of motion. Look flow was used that as the definition uh, relation. The problem was solved in a two-dimensional symmetric formulation. Equation of motion diffusion equation was solved numerically by the establishment method uh, proposed by Wilson. Um, we simulated uniaxial loading with a tender stress 650 megapascal of a cylindrical sample with a diameter of 10 millimeters. Due to the symmetry, the geometry of the simulated model was the quarter of a cylinder uh, section figure two. The nodes on the lower side were prohibited from displacement in the vertical direction OY, and the node points on the left side were prohibited from displacement in the horizontal direction OX. The notch with a length of uh, 23,000 uh, millimeters on the outer surface was uh, considered as a stress concentrator. Uh, this section of length had no movement restrictions. The material of the cylindrical sample is high strength steel ESD uh, 1080. Its physical properties are shown in table one. We establish the initial distribution of hydrogen over the sample as follows. Well. And the entire simulated area at the ground uniform concentration one tenth for TPM was set, and the systematically observed hydrogen content in the samples after changing the hydrogen limited to the skip effect was represented by the concentration uh, 10 TPM in the surface layer of the thickness of one element. It was assumed that the crack uh, would propagate along the left edge of the modeling section, and the fracture criterion was the excess of elastic stress obtained by solving the static problem our value of the cohesive stress. As soon as this uh, relationship was fulfilled, the restriction on displacement along the horizontal axis or x was removed, and the mesh node, uh, it was able to break away from the edge and move under the action of the tender load. Considering the symmetry, in this way, the opening of the crack faces and the propagation of the crack at one internal distance are established. Um, fulfillment of fracture criterion in the first mesh node has a good intensity at the very 
first step in time integration. Do a high stasis and the significant level of hydrogen content in the surface layer. The distribution of the elastic stress component, uh, component acting along the horizontal axis never notch is shown in Figure 3. It's seen that the maximum tensile stress drops of never concentration. The value of the first node along the correct propagation line was uh, 750 megapascal. Hydrogen concentration distribution is shown in Figure 4. Changes in concentration at this stage were insignificant. The hydrogen content in the first node of the mesh decreased to 9,998. And uh, in the second node, increased from the background value of uh, one tenth to 1.0024 ppm. However, it was found that for the distribution of hydrogen and its movement to the second mesh node, which is supposed to play self decohesion, it takes some time in solving the diffusion problem. The calculated time of this process was 51.69 seconds. Uh, the critical hydrogen concentration was 1.223 dBm. The value of tangential stress in the current concentration was 1,010 uh, megapascal. And at subsequent stages of the solution, uh, for each next mesh node along the left edge, the tendency of an increase in the time interval between the fulfillment of the structure criterion for two Success of nodes persisted. It took more and more time in solving the diffusion problem, but it was necessary to redistribution and accumulation of hydrogen layer by concentration. The corresponding dependency shown in figure 5. It's seen that the maximum calculated time was observed for decohesion of the six nodes, which corresponds to a distance of 0 0.158 mm from the sample surface. Uh, the time elapsed between the fulfillment of the fracture criterion as the fifth and sixth uh, mesh node was uh, 185.78 seconds. The critical hydrogen concentration won, was uh, 0.281 ppm. The distribution of the elastic stress component and resulting hydrogen concentration are shown in figure 6 and 7 respectively. It's obvious that the level of tensile stresses at near the concentrator will steadily increase as the crack propagates. Due to this, the excess of the level of elastic stress over the value of cohesive stress is possible at the lower level of hydrogen concentration. Consequently, it takes uh, less time in solving the diffusion problem. This support is confirmed by the figure 5. It seems the time between the fulfillment of fracture criterion in two successive nodes up to six gradually decrease. This tendency was observed up to the 13th node, which corresponds to a distance of 480,000 uh, millimeters from the central surface. The, uh, the distribution of elastic stress component and the resulting hydrogen concentration at this moment are shown in figure 8 and 9, respectively. Uh, the critical hydrogen concentration that led to the fulfillment of the uh, fracture criterion was only 0 0.102 ppm here. After that, the value of elastic stasis acting near the constructor became so great that the background concentration existing in the material was sufficient to achieve the necessary reduction in the level of cohesive stasis. Consequently, fulfillment of fracture criteria in each subsequent mesh node uh, occurred instantly at very first start, uh, step in time integration. Figure 10 shows the distribution of high concentration along the radius of a cylindrical specimen at different moments in time from the initial state to the propagation of the crack to a quarter of its thickness. It's clear, uh, it's clear thing that as the crack propagates, hydrogen is gradually distributed with the sample surface and moves deep uh, into the material under the action of applied stresses. But it's important to note that it does not uh, penetrate deeper than 0 0.418 mm from the surface layer. Due to the high stresses uh, acting on the crack propagation line, the initial background hydrogen concentration is sufficient for further detection of the sample. Plus, as a result of the addition of the spin effect of charging to the today model of hydrogen bitterness, the structure pattern becomes homogeneous. Little fracture is observed near the surface layer, which is associated with the increased uh, concentration of hydrogen. In experimental tests, such reactions of a sample will cause areas of hydrogen in bitumen. Fracture in the middle part of the specimen occurs according to the decision mechanism of the growth. 
Such a dual uh, character of deception is often observed in experiments. As a rule, this fact is interpreted by the simultaneous section of two mechanisms of uh, hydrogen induced deception, today and hell. Moreover, in uh, recent researches devoted to the description of uh, observed in practice the duality of hydrogen induced destruction, the hybrid model H plus today was applied. According to this concept, the uh, capture mechanism was determined by the local hydrogen concentration at the tractic. In work devoted to this hybrid model, it was shown that the health mechanism works at hydrogen concentration below the threshold value, while the activation of the hydrogen mechanism requires reaching critical concentration. But these works were based on the own analysis of uh, microstructural fracture surface, uh, direct measurements of the quality concentration distribution have not been carried out. To assess the results of the calculations, uh, most researchers used by calculation uh, data presented in Safroni study as uh, reference data on the distribution of hydrogen concentration. According to this data, the hydrogen concentration at the corrective is orders of magnitude higher than the average values of its content in the sample. The reason for this increase is the formation of a large number of hydrogen sites due to a deformation. As calculations made by the authors of the help, uh, of the help model show, hydrogen has a significant effect on the mechanical properties of the material at uh, its local mass concentration uh, of the order of 10 to the negative second power. It's unattainably high and is not absorbed in most metals. From the calculation of local plasticity performed uh, in the theoretical analysis of crack with a spherical peak, it follows that the local concentration of hydrogen as a crack peak is about uh, 100 times higher than the average. While in fact, the average mass concentration is, is usually about 10 to the negative 6th power, and the local concentration are no more than 10 to the negative 4th power. From this discrepancy between the results of the verification calculation of the upper solar model and the experimental data, it shows that the assumption about the action of the help mechanism of fracture at a low average hydrogen concentration is incorrect. At this level of concentration, it's uh, impossible to achieve such a local uh, accumulation of hydrogen caused by external mechanical uh, states that can start the physical mechanisms of health. Almost all publications on the HELP and HEDE models use the assumptions of the initially uniform hydrogen concentration. The presence of such inconsistency in the known approaches allows us to say that the non-uniform distribution as a result of charging the samples with hydrogen is the true reason for the dual nature of the destruction observed in nature. And let's get down to the conclusion. We carry out a finite element simulation of a dis of hydrogen charged steels, linear of notch specimen. The calculations were performed on the basis of the HD model of hydrogen brittleness, taking into account the experimentally observed in effect of charging the sample of this hydrogen. We found that this effect has a significant influence on the nature of the destruction of the specimens, despite its very shallow depth. The simulation results showed that, uh, in this case, at first, hydrogen induced brittle fracture occurs near the sample surface. And when the care growth occurs at ordinary background values of hydrogen concentration due to slower progression of hydrogen diffusion processes. Such a change in the nature of destruction leads to a dual fracture for them. The, uh, the fracture surface of a sample will contain areas of hydrogen abutment and areas of ordinary destruction. In this way, the non uniform distribution of hydrogen concentration can be the main source of the extremely observed dual nature of destruction which is commonly explained by the simultaneous action of the help and today mechanisms at the moment. That is all. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Julia. And uh, now we have uh, time for uh, some questions. Uh, colleagues, please. Uh, okay, then okay. I... Uh, I would like to ask... Uh, I am Sergei Uriya. Uh, okay, Sergey, please. Yes, uh, dear Yuri, thank you for interesting, real interesting presentation. And uh, my questions, uh, first question about uh, diffusion equations, which you wrote. Is it your equations or not? No, no. Yes, this is one. Uh, no, uh, nowadays, it's usually used to describe this process. 
not my. Uh, uh, yes, I see. Uh, and uh, the second question is about uh, the degradation law. Uh, the next, uh, yes. Uh, did you consider the influence of um, nonlinear uh, terms for degradation law for or not? My um, question about influence on nonlinear uh, effects for degradation model. I want to say that this dependence uh, dependence uh, was proposed by Sidipinsky in uh, his work and uh -huh. it, uh, was based on the approximation. I understand this of, one, but uh, yes. did you study this one, influence of this one or not? Uh, no. uh, not. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Uh, this dependence is very interesting. Uh, uh, no one uh, see, no one saw this. Uh, uh, how it uh, was uh, uh, get? <laughs> um, it's only the approximation of the graph uh, that was presented in the works of co-authors of Serebrinsky. and uh, nowadays all researchers who uh, simulate uh, such uh, uh, process of uh, hydrogen induced structure used with uh, dependence. Thank you, thank you very much. Very interesting, yes, thank you. Okay, thank you, Julia. And uh, now we uh, go to uh, next presentation and uh, the next speaker is uh, uh, Solomon Silopalina from Moscow. Uh, yeah. Good day, everyone. Uh, did you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Yeah. And see okay. your presentation. Uh, that's good. Good day. My name is Solomon Sopalina, and my work is dedicated to modification of the Lagrange multiplier method with a detached contact boundary for modeling contact for interaction. Um, consider a contact problem of two elastic bodies. Let two bodies, B1 and B2, make a contact as a result of applied loads. The contact condition uh, depends on the gap between bodies, which takes this form. Here, x1 and x2 are points at uh, bodies 1 and 2, respectively. Gamma 1 and gamma 2 are surfaces of the bodies. And n is the uh, outer point and vector normal to surface B1 at point x1. The contact between bodies occurs if uh, the gap is equal to zero, at least in one point. Otherwise, there is no contact. Basically, we have two fundamental contact conditions. The first uh, is a non-penetration condition, and for it, we need to make equal normal to contact boundary components of displacement. Here, gamma C is a contact boundary. The second condition is uh, an equality of force interaction of bodies against each other. And for it, we need to make equal normal component of stresses. Um, we consider a two-dimensional case. And uh, according to the theory of elasticity, we have three basic relations. It's Cauchy tensor, equation of Hooke's law and equilibrium equations. Here, H uh, is a matrix um, related to elastic parameters of body's material. And uh, we consider a case of plane strain. In this work, we use finite elements method with linear triangle elements. We also use a method of minimization of potential energy for getting the finite difference equations. And finally, we use the Lagrange multiplier method with a detached contact boundary for contact conditions. In the process of obtaining 
finite difference equations, we need to take uh, this contact integral. Here, lambda is a function of Lagrange multipliers, x1 and x2 are congruent points of bodies 1 and 2. Um, for taking this integral, we uh, construct a contact boundary and um, then we take our integral along this boundary. We have four steps. At first, we look at uh, measures of the bodies and find all points where the gap is less or equal to zero. We address them contact points, it's uh, red ones on the slide. Then we plot, uh, we construct uh, a contact boundary using these contact points as a middle line between them. Then we introduce uh, Lagrange multipliers, as many as we want. And uh, finally, uh, we split our contact boundary into segments. We address them contact intervals. And on each contact interval, we use quadrature formula. For that, uh, we, at each point PE, we construct normal to contact boundary and uh, find congruent points uh, as uh, intersects in the intersection of uh, this normal and surface of the body. Approximation of the Lagrange multiplier function can be introduced in different ways. We use three of them. It's a piecewise constant, linear, and linear with gap. Basically, in this work, we use only the first one, piecewise constant. This choice is justified by the fact that uh, we use linear triangle elements, and uh, thus um, our stress will be constant on each finite element. Consider a few tests. We have a system of two bars with inclined contact boundary. The first bar lies on the smooth table, the second bar lies on the first one, and uh, the second bar is also loaded with pressure P. The parameters of uh, this uh, problem are shown in the slide. We have geometrical parameters, parameters for the materials, here, new is uh, Poisson's ratio, and E is Young's modulus. We have pressure and meshes. Um, as you can see, we have mismatched on contact boundary meshes. On this slide, you can see uh, horizontal and vertical distribution of displacement and stresses. As you can see, we have uh, stress concentrators in the corners of the bars. But it's more interesting to look uh, at uh, normal to contact boundary components of displacement and stresses. Uh, there are uh, calculations with two and four contact intervals. Here, the uh, upper body is marked by red line and lower body by black line. You can see that we have distribution in displacement and stresses, but if we increase the number of uh, contact intervals, our solution improves. Uh, for displacement, the solution is good for, and uh, more importantly, um, the solution good for stresses. We have uh, some divergence in the corners, but uh, it can be explained by stress concentrators. Now let's consider another test. We have uh, two bars, but with a nonlinear contact boundary. The first bar lies on the smooth table, the second bar lies on the first, and the second bar is also loaded with pressure P. We have uh, fixed, uh, we fixed all, both bodies horizontal on left and right sides and uh, we fixed uh, the lower body in the bottom. Contact boundary can be described by this parametric equation and we also have uh, geometric parameters, parameters of material 
pressure and meshes. Here, meshes are always uh, are also mismatched. On this slide, you can see vertical distribution of uh, components of vertical components of displacement and stresses. Um, we have a stress concentrators in the corners of the system. And also you can see that vertical component of stress is close to normal one in the center of the system, where is the vertex of the parabola. Here we have a normal distribution, a distribution of normal components of displacement and stresses with calculations uh, on two and 10 contact intervals. We have uh, divergence in displacement and stresses, but if we increase number of contact intervals, our solution improves. We have um, some divergence in the stresses in the corners of the system, which can be explained by stress concentrators. But also we have uh, some divergence in the center of the system, where is the vertex of the parabola. Uh, it can be explained that uh, this point uh, has uh, the maximum curvature and uh, apparently our method is uh, sensitive to it. Now let's consider other variants of uh, approximation of the Lagrange multiplier function. Let me remind you, I have three of them. It's a piecewise constant, linear, and linear with gap. Now we show linear function. For demonstration, we use uh, our example with two bars with inclined contact boundary. On the slide, you can see distribution of normal components of displacement and stress with 20 and 40 contact intervals. As you can see, we have uh, significant divergence uh, even on 40 contact intervals. But if we try to use linear with gap function, the third variant of approximation, we can achieve uh, a very good result even on uh, 30 contact intervals. Uh, we also have a pretty good result in the corners of the system where the stress concentrators occurs. And uh, its conclusion, we propose the modification of the Lagrange multipliers method with detached contact boundary. We calculate a few tests so with the system of two bars with different contact boundaries. The detached contact boundary allows us to improve its geometric description and also allows us to choose the best variant of approximation of the Lagrange multiplier function. We use uh, three of them, it's piecewise constant, linear and linear with gap. And apparently linear with gap is the best variant for approximation and uh, linear is the worst. Our proposed technique can be sensitive uh, to the points with uh, the maximum curvature. But uh, we can refine the solution by decreasing discretization of the contact boundary without changing meshes of the contact bodies. That's all. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Polina. And uh, now we have uh, some time for questions. Uh, colleagues, please. Any questions? Okay, and now we can uh, go to the next presentation. And the uh, next speaker is uh, Tishin Pavel uh, from Moscow. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, we see your screen. Oh, thank you. Bending a beam made of material with strain state dependent properties. Mechanical properties of materials containing defects of various nature 
crack spores such as structural graphite, concrete, various rocks, show dependence on loading conditions. Uh, such uh, materials can be uh, characterized, uh, their properties can be characterized by the following properties. Uh, the absence of a single diagram of uh, the connection of uh, equivalent stress and equivalent strain. Uh, and, for example, uh, dependence of uh, volumetric deformations on a shear strain. Uh, uh, this paper discusses uh, one of uh, the constitutive equations uh, that um, can be used to describe uh, these properties. Uh, uh, let's consider the initial hypothesis uh, to construct uh, such a constitutive equation. Uh, there uh, must exist a potential for our constitutive equation. Uh, deformations are considered small. It is taken into account the dependence of the potential only on the first invariant of uh, deformations and the intensity of deformations. Uh, and uh, with uh, certain material parameters, our model uh, must be equal to uh, the model of linear elasticity. And uh, uh, after uh, study of uh, some sets of, uh, exp of experimental data on uh, various types of uh, rocks uh, and uh, concrete, and various types of concrete, we uh, considered to use uh, uh, such type of like a constitutive equation. Uh, we can see here we can see uh, the potential of this equation, and uh, following we can see the equation, constitutive equation. E, C, B, and K are material constants that uh, can be determined by analysis of experimental data on complex loading. And when uh, K equals one and C equals zero, uh, this expression is uh, equal to the linear elasticity model. Uh, and uh, also, this equation uh, is equivalent to, to the equation 2 and 3 also. And uh, we can use uh, equations 2 and 3 to uh, get uh, the material uh, parameters from experimental data. Mm. Uh, it is necessary to select suitable experimental data, allowing at each moment of the experiment to obtain the values of uh, stress, stress intensity, strain and strain intensity. Uh, then uh, the experimental data is used to construct uh, surfaces 4 and 5. Uh, and uh, then via the methods of regressional analysis, uh, we can, uh, uh, using equations 2 and 3, to get uh, material parameters of our model. Uh, so, uh, uh, the experimental data which was published in the work uh, on the bottom of the screen, Plasticity of Rocks by Stavrogin and Protasenia, is appropriate uh, for our case. Uh, in that work, the results of tests of, of various rocks are presented. Uh, tests were carried out on the specially designed proportional loading testing machine uh, using cylindrical specimens. Uh, the strains obtained in the experiments are small, therefore the potential relations of the nonlinear theory of elasticity are applicable to describe the material's behavior. Uh, the studies were carried out under conditions of volumetric stress state, uh, with when uh, uh, sigma 1 uh, is uh, the axial uh, stress and uh, sigma 2 and uh, sigma 3 are lateral stresses. Uh, and on the left side of the screen, we can see the correspondence uh, of uh, our model with uh, the experimental data for various uh, types of uh, uh, stress state. Uh, stress state equals uh, uh, the uh, first invariant of uh, stress divided by the stress intensity. And on the bottom of the screen, we can see the material parameters uh, for our model. And also, we can uh, uh, get uh, from these equations the material parameters for linear elasticity model, uh, which we later will use to compare results for our model and for linear elasticity model. Also, um, uh, these uh, uh, material equations uh, were uh, implemented in uh, NCIS. Uh, Finite element analysis system. Uh, to, uh, there were some uh, technical problems, but uh, they are not uh, the task of this presentation to discuss them. 
Uh, now, all that we need to know that uh, to implement uh, that um, material model, we need uh, uh, to uh, calculate the Jacobian tensor components for our constitutive equation, and it also was done. Uh, our model is uh, simple, so uh, this can be done analytically. Uh, and uh, then uh, we can uh, compare uh, the results of uh, uh, calculational experiment made with uh, ANSYS with uh, the experimental data. And uh, here we can see that uh, the correspondence between them is appropriate for various uh, types of stress state. And next, uh, we uh, sim can simulate the bending of a beam made from talco chloride uh, with the material parameters determined as uh, spoken above. Uh, beam dimensions are uh, width uh, and thickness are equal 5 millimeters, length is equal 20 millimeters. Uh, cantilevered beam, uh, 2000 newton force is applied at the other end in the y axis direction. The z axis is along the largest axis of the beam. And uh, then we can uh, use infinite element analysis method, we can get uh, the results of. Uh, uh, beam bending. And here on the screen we can see uh, the results uh, for uh, stress tensor components in a projection on a line coinciding with the central longitudinal axis of the beam. On the next screen we can uh, see the results uh, for the stress tensor components for the same model. And also uh, we calculated the distribution of uh, stress and strain state rate along the beam axis. And uh, I'm afraid that's all. Uh, this presentation discusses the problem of bending a beam made of material with properties that depend on the type of deformed state. Uh, the same problem was solved using the linear elasticity model. And uh, uh, we can see that uh, between uh, the results of using the linear model and our model is uh, some difference. Uh, whether this difference is uh, big enough or not, uh, it is. Uh, it must be study of another. Must be conducted. Another study must be con conducted. Uh, thank you. I'm afraid that's all. Can you hear me? Thank you, Paul. And uh, we have time for some question. Questions? Can I ask short questions if they are again over here? Uh, yes, of course, please. Sorry, me, please. Can I can I take can I ask? Uh, my my hello? Oh I, I can hear you. Uh, uh, so uh, my question is about potential energy. Can you can you uh, so there's one again? Uh, yes, uh, the deformation is uh, uh, epsilon without zero is here. What is, is what is deformation? There are not uh, Cauchy relations because I could not see uh, since that uh, is deformation. That is not deformation. Epsilon is deformation or not? Epsilon is deformation. Is is, 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 uh, is a strain tensor. Epsilon, if, epsilon, epsilon is uh, the first invariant of the strain tensor. Epsilon zero is uh, intensity. So it's first, in, first, in, first invariant. Yeah. Yes, uh, we, we can see the first invariant depends only on uh, two, uh, two invariants. No, sir. Then, uh, okay. then it's okay. Without this one, it will be uh, not uh, objectivities. Then it's okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much. Maybe we have uh, another question from someone. No. Okay. Uh, let uh, us uh, uh, go to next presentation, and uh, the next speaker is uh, Nikolai Banichuk uh, from Moscow.
Николай, are you here? Николай? Окей, uh, okay. I guess we unfortunately uh, don't have Николай here. And uh, we have to go to to uh, next speaker, uh, Григорьев Александр. Hello, how you hear me? Uh, we hear you very well. Uh, second, please, I try to share my presentation from smartphone. Ой. Can you see presentation? Yes, we can see your presentation. Oh, it's good. Uh, so we begin. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Alexander Grigoryev. Uh, <clears throat> I'm from Tomsk, uh, from Institute of Strength Physics and uh, Material Science. Uh, my work is devoted to the study of uh, sliding friction behavior of novel aluminum bronze based composite reinforced by boron carbide particles. Uh, 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 it is uh, difficult to combine these uh, materials into composite with a uh, gradient uh, distribution of uh, particles, uh, especially using uh, additive manufacturing. Uh, in our institute, uh, Dr. Filipov uh, and uh, our colleagues uh, have developed an additive manufacturing technology uh, that allows uh, doing this. So uh, uh, this composite uh, has outstanding anti-friction properties. Uh, in particular, this is a low value of coefficient of friction, and uh, uh, he and uh, it uh, possesses high wear resistance. To so uh, my so aim of this work was. Uh, to study the peculiarities of sliding friction behavior of this material and uh, to develop the uh, computational model for numerical stimulation um, of such of materials of materials such of such type. Uh, so my work is uh, uh, my work consists of the two main parts. Uh, it is uh, experimental part and uh, part of uh, numerical simulation. Uh, that, uh, then we uh, turn to uh, objective and motivations. Uh, firstly, I would uh, like to say about uh, uh, this material uh, as I said above, uh, it, it is consists of uh, two components. Uh, the first component it is uh, aluminum bronze. Uh, it is uh, w widely used uh, for producing anti-corrosion and uh, wear resistance products. Uh, the second uh, component is uh, boron carbide particles. Uh, uh, it is uh, proved to be an effective material uh, for reinforcing metal matrix composite, uh, uh, and uh, as well as uh, for improving the wear resistance of uh, such aluminum alloy. Uh, 
here we can see uh, the schematic illustration of uh, manufacturing process of this material. Uh, this uh, additive manufacturing using 3D printer. Uh, this is combined wire and powder bed technique uh, to produce uh, such material. Uh, it should be noted that uh, uh, such a technique uh, allow us to uh, to produce material with uh, uh, unusual uh, gradient distribution of reinforcing particles. Uh, and uh, it looks very promising for tribological uh, applications. Uh, more details about the manufacturing process and uh, some experimental data you can find uh, in the reference above uh, below. Uh, next slide shows uh, some figures uh, with a uh, general view of 3D printer for wear based electron beam additive uh, manufacturing. And uh, uh, for, for example, uh, printed samples uh, presented. And now we uh, turn to some experimental results. Uh, here we uh, here here presented uh, some uh, pictures uh, that uh, obtained by optical microscopy of uh, uh, this material. Uh, it is uh, cross section uh, areas views of cross section areas. Uh, along height of the sample, so A it is a uh, top of uh, top surface uh, layers, and uh, B it is uh, subsurface layer, and uh, C and D it is middle and bottom layers. Here, uh, two types of the composite material uh, are presented. The first it is uh, material uh, with 50% uh, uh, volume fraction uh, of boron carbide particles. And uh, the second is the uh, 25% uh, volume fraction of carbon, no, boron, car boron carbide, uh, carbide particles. Uh, here we uh, see, oh, Uh, we can see that the, at the top of the at the top layers of materials, the volume fraction of boron carbide particles is uh, very high, and the bottom layers uh, volume fraction of boron carbide particles is uh, uh, is very low and then uh, such a gradient structure is uh, present. And so uh, such a gradient structure of materials, of, of uh, this material uh, uh, sorry this uh, structure of of this material significantly improves its uh, frictional properties and also increases the surface hardness. Uh, this uh, two graphs shows show the correlation between the volume fraction and boron carbide particles uh, and surface uh, hardness. And then uh, on the next slide, we can see the coefficient of friction uh, and the uh, profiles of uh, weird groove for the two samples with uh, different uh, volume fraction of boron carbide uh, particles. Uh, the values of coefficient of friction reach uh, 
uh, reaches uh, values up to 0 0.2, 0 0.25, and and uh, should be noted that uh, uh, um, less uh, volume content of born carbide particles, uh, which you can see but, uh, on the right graph, it is blue curve, uh, results uh, in higher wear resistance. Uh, um, it means that the uh, weird volume is uh, a less uh, it uh, unexpected results, and uh, we try to explain this. Uh, so, next slide, it is uh, our possible uh, explanation. Uh, here, uh, the schematic illustration uh, of abrasive wear of these uh, samples are presented uh, for two types of samples. Uh, so, uh, uh, we assume that the, uh, that the boron carbide particles uh, act as an abrasive and uh, uh, then, so bigger particles uh, results in higher wear. Uh, it is our explanation of uh, such an expectable result. Uh, and then we turn to the uh, simulation uh, results. Uh, numerical simulation part, uh, and uh, I uh, want to say, say that uh, we used the numerical method of mobile cellular automaton. Uh, this is uh, one of the discrete element method. Uh, uh, in the framework of this method, an uh, object of simulation is uh, considered as an ensemble of discrete elements of finite size and uh, uh, which can interact which, uh, with each other. Uh, the main feature of this uh, method is the many body uh, in interaction. Uh, when, no, many body formulation of interaction between discrete elements. Uh, it is based on the Wiener Rosenblatt model, uh, well known in uh, mole molecular dynamics. And uh, uh, stable automaton formalism, it means uh, that the uh, pairs of the elements can uh, Uh, have two possible states, uh, bonded state and unbonded state, uh, and the uh, transition between uh, these two states uh, describe uh, failure or micro-welding processes. Uh, motion, uh, uh, movement of the elements is determined by the newton euler equations of motion. Uh, automaton response function uh, that we can see at the right of the slide. Uh, I used to compute the inter interacting force between the elements. And uh, I should uh, note uh, that uh, here we, for first time, used the new criterion for uh, breaking interparticle bonds. Uh, it's criterion based uh, on uh, plastic work energy instead of the old uh, stress-based criterion. Um, more details about this criterion and uh, its implementation 
uh, in the framework of our methods method uh, you can find in the reference and we turn to the next slide uh, that uh, present a structure of the samples that we construct uh, uh, in the framework of the method. Uh, at the top of slide, uh, uh, the structure and the loading scheme of the sample are pre is presented. Uh, we modeled sliding friction of two rough surf surfaces. Uh, for two types of the samples. Uh, the first it is a pure metal matrix, uh, pure aluminum bronze uh, sample. And the second is the composite uh, sample uh, with uh, circular inclusions uh, of boron carbide particles with uh, volume fraction of uh, five and 10%. And then we turn to results of numerical simulation. Here we uh, obtain uh, coefficient of friction uh, dynamics for, for two types of uh, samples. Um, we see that the coefficient of friction for metal matrix uh, composite is less than for pure bronze, but not too small uh, as in the experiment. Uh, here we can see two dimensional samples for, uh, for modern friction of, of uh, metal matrix composite. Uh, uh, due to the ability of the elements to form new bonds, uh, uh, new uh, weir particles between uh, top and bottom part of sample uh, are formed. Uh, these particles uh, act as a new contact spots. And, uh, even at the running in stage, uh, formation of these uh, particles on the uh, uh, even at the running in stage, formation of new contact spots uh, on weir particles uh, proceeds much more faster uh, for metal matrix composite due to the. Uh, hard uh, particles are stress concentrators. In addition, uh, the, uh, uh, in addition, uh, uh, um, particles of uh, metal matrix composites uh, possess more rounded shape. At the steady state stage uh, the rounded weir particles prevent well wedging and uh, thereby reduce the uh, amplitude of fluctuation in the coefficient of friction. At the same time, uh, the weak adhesion of the particles to the surface determines a significant decrease in the overall level of the friction coefficient. Um, difference between the simulation and uh, experiment, experimental uh, results uh, force it us to take into account the change of the matrix properties uh, due to the, uh, the specific features of uh, fabrication of the, this material. In particular, uh, we know we are known that uh, in the process of cooling, the geometrically necessary dislocations are formed in the metal matrix. 
we try to take uh, this into account by changing the response function of the matrix. Theoretically, uh, the, according to the Shibata and uh, Gao and Huang, uh, the response function of the matrix should be like a blue curve. Uh, but uh, experimentally, uh, we observed uh, even a greater hardening of the matrix. Uh, uh, so we tried uh, the uh, another variant uh, of the response function that uh, that uh, indicated by Lilac curve. Uh, the next slide uh, presents the dynamics of coefficient of friction for uh, different type of uh, uh, function uh, response function of matrix, and we can see that. Uh, 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 the dyna dynamics of uh, friction co coefficient was changed uh, and uh, the value of the coefficient of friction uh, much more closer to the experimental results. That is uh, good uh, for us. And uh, in addition, we uh, obtain the more rounded particles for metal matrix composite. It is, uh, it is good for us too. And uh, that's, uh, end of my presentation. Uh, so here we uh, present, here present uh, conclusions. Uh, first of all, it is experiment. Experiments showed that the re reinforcement of aluminum bronze matrix uh, with boron carbide particles allowed uh, improving the wear resistance. Coefficient of friction reduced uh, from 0. To six to zero point one uh, nine. Uh, using computer modeling, it was shown that uh, the mechanical effect of hardening inclusions determine a more rounded shape of wear particles, uh, preventing wedging and uh, thereby uh, increasing the stability of, of but. Uh, just a uh, slight decrease in coefficient of friction. Uh, strengthening of the strengthening, strengthening the matrix uh, leads to reduce uh, the number of wear uh, particles. And uh, so four uh, is a factor of determining the overall value of coefficient of friction. Uh, thus, the simulation uh, results confirm the super uh, Supposition uh, derived, derived uh, from the experimental evidence uh, that electron beam additive manufacturing of uh, composite leads to additional reinforcing uh, of aluminum bronze matrix by, by boron carbide dissociation and precipitation. So when content in the copper melt uh, bed, uh, the carbon as boron carbide uh, may dissociate into the boron and carbon. Uh, boron then may dissociate, uh, dissolve uh, in uh, copper and uh, form cuprum bor uh, irritatix. Uh, while carbon stays free in the form of uh, the black particles. The simulation results also confirm uh, that the higher friction coefficient of uh, pure bronze may be explained by the higher adhesion of this material, uh, while the presence of carbide and uh, carbon particles reduce, reduces uh, the adhesion and consequently uh, the value of friction coefficient. So that all.
soon q for your intention. Uh, thank you, Alexander. And uh, we have a little time for maybe one short question, colleagues. Uh, okay, then I can ask uh, one uh, about uh, the about your simulations. Uh, uh, is it uh, possible to perform your simulations with the aid of uh, common packages for mole molecular dynamics? I guess, uh, for example, uh, LAMS package, uh, well-known package, uh, allows to perform uh, simulations on a uh, mesoscale. All methods that you use is essentially specific and not implemented in, uh, uh, in common packages. Uh, yes, I see. Um, thank you for your question. Uh, uh, be difference between uh, our met method and uh, molecular dynamics uh, method uh, is uh, uh, discrete element method uh, operating the finite volumes of the material and uh, mole mo molecular dynamics uh, operating uh, the single atoms uh, often. Um, here we um, modeled the uh, finite uh, volume of the um, material and uh, molecular dynamics uh, needs to uh, uh, sorry uh, I запутался а you can you можете по-русски ответить ну я как предполагаю что молекулярная динамика она больше оперирует ну отдельными атомами там осматриваются дислокации и так далее Uh, наш метод, он сосредоточен больше на описании ну, элементов как конечного объема, ну, то есть э, усредненные по объему свойства используются. И это позволяет нам использовать э, приближение ну, континуальной механики. Это более ну, выигрышно на мезоуровне по сравнению с молекуляркой. А, все, я понял, именно контину, континуализация идет. Просто, ну, да. Лэмпс там, ну, ну, может какие-то частицы на мезоуровне моделировать, но они обычно, ну, именно все-таки как частицы рассматриваются, да. там дискретные. Там нужен потенциал, а здесь у нас просто идет, ну, как закон Гука и там модели пластичности, которые ну, хорошо известны уже, мы их можем реализовывать. Плюс ко всему этому идет такое естественное моделирование э, разрушения, то есть, э, ну, как вот, вот такое, допустим, молекуляркой будет очень сложно выделить. Образование вот таких частиц износа молекуляркой, я так понимаю, будет сложновато получить. Ясно. Uh -huh. well, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Alexander. And uh, now we uh, go to uh, to the uh, last uh, presentation for this section. And the uh, next speaker is uh, Artem Savikovsky from uh, Saint Petersburg. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay. And, uh, I guess you probably. Oh, okay. Uh, and okay, now you my... can see your screen. Okay. Can you see my presentation? Yes, we see your presentation. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, my result is devoted to numerical aspects of the gene integral estimation for thermal and mechanical, mechanical loading in fracture mechanics. It is a, it's a collective work with my colleague, uh, Gardiev Alexander who would result with me and uh, his supervisor, Dr. Olga Antonova and Mikhailov Alexander, and my supervisor, Dr. Artem Semenov. Okay. 
Magizot is devoted to terminal quarks, so there are a lot of examples of terminal quarks. Uh, one of them, uh, one of one of important points for oil processing are catalyst lines. Uh, thermal thermal loading acts on this uh, part because environment temperature may be minus 60 degrees Celsius and temperature of transported matter in catalyst slides may be 600 degrees temperature. So thermal gradients uh, acts on these parts and uh, may cause thermal defects cracks as we shown in this slide. Uh, also, I should mention gas turbine plates uh, which work uh, at high temperature conditions and uh, high temperature cause uh, thermal and thermal fatigue cracks. Uh, fracture criteria are used for reduction of rate propagation. One of them is uh, the invariant uh, Ashley Rice Chiripanov's G integral, uh, which uh, is invariant for smooth, for different smooth and convex contours. There is uh, a G integral definition and uh, integration contours. Uh, the integrals consist from two terms for mechanical loading and uh, three terms for thermomechanical loading. Uh, the, third, the third term is uh, because of thermal loading, which uh, consists uh, from thermal linear expansion coefficient and temperature gradient. Uh, there are Two finite element software were used for fracture parameter implementations, Pantocrator and ANSYS. Pantocrator is a finite element software which was developed by Dr. Artem Semyonov which, uh, with the complicated uh, materials models. Uh, it uses uh, three numerical methods for fracture parameter implementation, displacement extrapolation method, stress extrapolation method, and equivalent domain integration method. The first two methods uh, Calculate displacement and stress distribution and, and estimates estimate uh, stress intensity factor. Uh, the equivalent of integration method uh, uses expression for G integral, which uh, uh, consists of uh, area integration and converts it to volume integration. So, as Archer said, uh, this is more numerically effective. So, this method is developed by uh, Nikif Nikishkov, Gennady Pavlovich. Uh, so, go further. Uh, this is a synth built in command in ANSYS that uh, uses uh, auxiliary uh, fracture problem. Uh, the auxiliary fracture problem is the central crack of in infinite elastic isotropic body. And uh, synth command uses a superposi superpositional principle and calculates superimposed G integral for our original problem and auxiliary fracture problem. Uh, uh, superimposed G integral includes interaction integral cross term and uh, uh, using uh, G interaction integral values calculates transitivity factor. And uh, also use approach was developed for direct calculation for G integral which consists from two terms, or for three terms, I'm sorry. So uh, you can find more information about syn command and equivalent dimension integral methods in these papers. So uh, we consider the test problem for mechanical loading, the Griffith problem, uh, with finite length and wide. So uh, mechanical parameters and loads uh, presented in the slides, and for this problem, we have uh, reference Murakami's results. So, uh, we uh, solve this problem in plane strain formulation. So, it's a uh, problem formulation uh, is taking into account symmetry conditions. Uh, so, <clears throat> there is a finite element model that, which was used for this problem, and uh, it is a zoomed uh, figure with the different meshes. Uh, these different measures are used for different, uh, for convenient research of the integral values. Uh, the fifth and third zones uh, have a finite element, uh, quadratic finite element, and different other zones are transition transitions zones between them. Uh, 
each zones have a similar length on x axis and the number of elements decreased by two times from fifth zones to first zones. Uh, and part is the main parameters which characterize number of finite elements in the first zone near crack chip. This is a near, this is a crack chip and this crack. So <clears throat> we performed a convergence analysis for this problem. Uh, this is a number of degrees of freedom for different finite element models. As we can see, uh, we compared uh, conver convergences for this problem uh, for different uh, numerical methods. As we can see, the method in the ANSYS software converge more quickly than Pantagrata methods. And uh, uh, we can use uh, this models with n part is equal to 32 for further calculations. Uh, this is a picture shows, demonstrates uh, identical values for different contours, and uh, it's a resumed figure for zones near correct tip. As you can see, uh, this is uh, more common reference results and this uh, <coughs> uh, lines shows uh, the one percent error for more common results. As we can see, the integral values uh, show a, a, a good agreement with more common results and is in, the integral is invariant. Uh, so in finite element simulations, we can use uh, finite element with uh, different uh, shape functions, quadratic and linear. And uh, we can see that uh, using quadratic finite elements, we can obtain more accuracy results for all methods. It is connected with, because of uh, uh, high straight gradients near crack tip. But if we use equivalent domain integral method, we see uh, jumps of the integral values uh, in, on the borders of finite element meshes. This is a border of finite element meshes when we when <coughs> so. Uh, it's uh, connected with the uh, equivalent domain integral implementation because it consists uh, the terms with the second derivative of displacement. But if we can use regular mesh, uh, we obtain uh, identical values which good agreement with Murakami results and is invariant. So it's recommended to use regular mesh for equivalent domain integral method. Uh, and uh, this picture demonstrates uh, results for the integral values for different measures with other finite lengths of finite element. Uh, so we can use different uh, regular finite element mesh and uh, it shows a good result. As you can see, and the integral is an invariant. So, uh, this is a comparison with integral values for different methods. As we can see, it shows a uh, good agreement with more crimes results, and uh, all methods demonstrate near similar results. The next problem we considered is the Wilson problem, because it is the only problem uh, we have, analy have that an has analytical results we have found. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, we have uh, the linear temperature distribution for thermal loading and thermal mechanical parameters are shown in the slide. So we have analytical Wilson's results for this problem. It's a problem formulation with taking into account symmetry conditions. So uh, we see temperature displacement and stress intensity distribution. As we can see, uh, stress intensity is maximum near corrective. So our results are correct. Uh, we performed convert research again, and uh, we can see that uh, ANSYS methods uh, converge more quickly than Pantocrator methods again, as we can see in Griffith problem. And uh, we can use uh, this finite element method with n parts is equal to 32 for direct calculations or for further calculations. Uh, this is a uh, genetical values for different contours. As we can see, genetical is invariant, but uh, we observe, we observe 
uh, jumps between different meshes on the borders of these meshes. But uh, these methods uh, show the good agreement with Murakami's results. And uh, this is a 1% error for Murakami results. So we can use uh, quadratic and linear finite element uh, finite element for this problem. And uh, quadratic finite element show uh, results is uh, good accuracy, uh, better than when we're using linear finite elements. So as you can see in Griffith's problem, uh, as you can see, G integral is considered from three terms for thermal mechanical loading. These uh, terms are shown in the slide. And uh, we investigated uh, dependence, these terms on different contours. So this is a G integral. It's consists from three terms and it's invariant. As we can see, uh, the term is G term is equal to zero new gravity because uh, the term is connected with area integration and when the area is tends to zero, so and this term tends to zero. Uh, the integral was delivered by James Rice and uh, he noted in his paper that integration contour should be convex and uh, for non-convex contours, uh, the integral drains will be violated. And we check it out. So uh, we use integration contours that are shown in this slide. This is finite element models. And uh, this is uh, dependence on three terms from on different contours and the full G integral from different contours. So as you can see, G integral is not invariant for non convex contours. As, uh, so it shows it shows that our calculations are correct. So <clears throat> it is a com comparison for different methods for Wilson's problem. As you can see, all results show a good agreement with Wilson's results. And uh, we can see that uh, equivalent to my integral method shows the most accuracy results uh, comparing with other methods. So, <clears throat> Uh, the results of uh, numerical experiments has shown that equivalent domain integral method demonstrates the most accurate results for Wilson problem. Using of quadratic finite elements provides more accurate results for all methods in both problems comparing to use contour linear finite elements. G integral invariance is performed for convex contours and isn't performed for non convex contours. As you can see, the jumps of G integral values for different finite element measures in the models for both problems are observed. Uh, using of equivalent domain integral methods for irregular meshes leads to decrease accuracy of the integral invariance. And uh, we should use regular meshes. Uh, the integral includes two terms connected with contour integrations and area integration for 3D case, 2 dimensional case. This second term is connected with thermal loading and tends to zero when the area size tends to zero. So, so it's possible the integral values without taking into account term connected with area integrations near correct tip. So, <clears throat> thank you for your attention. Uh, okay, thank you, Artyom. And now we have time for questions. Uh, colleagues, do anyone have some questions? Uh, okay, let me... Uh, uh, ask one. Uh, uh, my question is about the narrow gems uh, of uh, G integral that you show at uh, frames. Uh, uh, how do you think? What uh, is the reason of it? Yes, yes about these narrow jumps. Uh, so, uh, these jumps, these jumps are observed in Griffith and uh, Wilson problem. So in Griffith problem, it's uh, connected with the uh, uh, second derivative of displacement. And uh, we sus suspect that uh, these jumps in Wilson's problem are connected with uh, this term, which includes uh, derivative for displacement. So because of uh, derivative for displacement, their uh, jumps are observed. Uh, but uh, 
Vega George maybe uh, jumps on will not absurd if we use regular mesh as we can use for if we <coughs> uh, use this regular mesh for Wilson and Griffith problem. Thank you for question. Uh -huh, okay, uh, thank you for answer. I see. Uh, okay, and uh, this was uh, last for presentation for this uh, section. And for now, we finished uh, our section. Uh, best regards for all participants. Uh, many thanks for all speakers for interesting presentations. Uh, and uh, good evening for everybody. Thank you again.